Leslie H. Zoller, Z-O-E-L-L-E-R. Detective Zoller, you've previously identified yourself as the investigating officer for the Beverly Hills Police Department in this case, is that correct? That's correct. A number of photographs of uh, various rooms and parts of uh, the residence at 722 Elm Drive have been introduced in this court. Are you familiar with those photographs? Yes, I am. And is it usual procedure in a homicide investigation for photographs to be taken of the scene? Yes. And as the investigating officer on, I guess, the early morning hours of August 21st, 1989, were you aware of the fact that uh, a large number of photographs were taken of the interior of the house? Yes, I am. If I may approach her. Yes. I'm holding a previously marked exhibit uh, 63. It's small. And do you recognize that photograph to be a photograph taken inside the master bedroom at 722 Elm Drive? Yes. And does that particular photograph show the location of the uh, IBM PC computer that was in that room? Yes, it does. And does that photograph show that the computer and its stand is to the right of the entry doors to the bedroom? Yes. And it is up against a wall, is it not? That's correct. I have it. Now, I've placed a series, may I stay, Your Honor, just to go through these photographs? Yes. I've placed a series of photographs in front of you that have been marked with new numbers 257 through 265. Let me ask you about them one at a time. Showing you 257, do you recognize what room of the residence that photograph was taken in? Yes, I do. And what room was it? This is uh, Eric's room, and it was a room upstairs on the south side of the residence toward the front. There was a, a guest bed, bedroom uh, further west than this at the front of the house. Okay. So it's, uh, it doesn't, it's not right on the front. Its windows don't open to the front of the house. That's correct. Do you know what its windows open to? To the south side of the house. And do you know if those windows overlook the pool area, the tennis court area, and provide a view of the guest house? It does not, no. Does not provide a view of those things? No. Now, the items and objects that are in this particular photograph, <coughs> to the best of your understanding, were they in that condition when your photographer arrived to photograph them? Yes. Is it a proper police procedure to not move items around at a crime scene? Yes, it is. And was the entire house, under your guidance, treated as a crime scene? Yes. So that nothing should have been moved in any room? That's correct. And would the same be true of putting things in rooms that were not there when the police arrived? That is also correct. No one should be doing that? No. And do you have any reason whatsoever to believe that anyone working on this investigation on the 21st of August, 1989, put anything in any of these rooms that was not already there? To my knowledge, nobody had done that. Showing you the next photograph, which I've previously marked, uh, 258. Is that another view of Eric's bedroom? Yes, it is. In your opinion, does it appear messy? Yes. When you observed it the morning of August 21st, were you struck with its messiness? Yes. Were there various um, writings like papers, magazines, books strewn about the room? Yes, there were. Did you uh, note any particular writing in any police report or inventory or property report? No. Did you collect any items from that room? Not to my knowledge, no. And did you inventory the contents of each and every one of these rooms? No.
showing you the next photograph, which has been marked 259. What room of the house does that appear to be? This is a, another photo of the master bedroom. And do you see uh, there appears to be a piece of equipment in the center of the photograph that has a, a, a jacket over it. Do you know what that equipment was? Uh, I believe it was a life cycle. An exercise bike? Yes. And there is a doorway beyond that piece of equipment. Do you know where it went? It went to the dressing rooms. Were there two separate dressing rooms and bathrooms off this master bedroom? Yes. And was access to both of them through this doorway, or was there another doorway? I believe it was just through this doorway. And was one of the dressing room, bathroom areas to the left of that doorway and the other to the right? Yes. Now, when you say dressing room, did that include closets? Yes. Let me take this out of here and I'll put it up. You recall testifying earlier that there were two rifles in a closet off the master bedroom. That's correct. And could you determine in looking at the clothing in each of those dressing rooms, which was Mr. Menendez's and which was Mrs. Menendez's? I believe so, yes. Was there female clothing, for example, yes. in one yes. and male clothing in the other? Yes. Do you recall in which closet the rifles were? I believe they were in Mr. Menendez's closet. Now, along those lines, did you see either in the bedroom or in Mr. Menendez's closet a wooden box or a wooden tray-like thing, the sort where men put their wallets and keys at the end of the night, men who don't carry purses? I don't recall. You have testified that the rifles were not loaded. That's correct. Did you ever examine the premises or search for ammunition for that rifle? Yes. And you didn't find any? That's correct. I'm <coughs> oh, sorry, I'm sure there's two persons. This is 260. Is that the same bedroom? Yes. And do you notice whether or not in, their in that photograph there is a window seat? Yes. And on the sides of the window seat, recessed, can you tell if there is anything there? It appears to be a bookcase with what appears to be books. Do they appear to be books, or do they also appear they, to be magazines? It, it's hard to tell. It could possibly be magazines. I take it you did not inventory those magazines. That's correct. Nor did you remove any from the house. That's correct. Now, showing you the next photograph, which is 261, does that appear to be a second window seat in the same bedroom? Yes. And does there appear to be bookcases recessed on the sides of that window seat? Yes, there are. I'm going to put these photographs up sort of overlapping. Is this sort of the way that part of the room looked? The two window seats and bookcases on either side of the fireplace. Yes. Now I would like to call your attention, Detective Zoller, perhaps I'll tilt this a tiny bit. to a uh, photograph, I believe this is 250. I'm not being contradicted. Um, you have previously testified that this item here was a glass of some sort that was on the coffee table in the den. That's correct. And it appears to have some white substance around the sides and some darker spots, correct? That's correct. Was there actual, any actual food inside the glass? No. It was basically just traces of food? That's correct. 
And did you, in examining that glass, determine, or at least form an opinion, as to what those traces were? Yes. And were those traces of blueberries? Yes. And was the white stuff traces of whipped cream? Yes. And was there only one such glass on the coffee table when you observed it? Containing that material, yes. Okay. And uh, it didn't have, it, it was intact, it wasn't broken. That's correct. It wasn't picked off, up, up off the floor and put there. That's correct. At least you hold the plate, it wasn't. Not by any of my people, anyway. Okay. And it doesn't appear to have uh, any evidentiary value, does it? I mean, it wasn't seized, it wasn't tested in any way. That's correct. It doesn't appear to have blood on it. No. Now I want to show you photograph 262. Do you recognize what room of the house that's in? It's a photo of the uh, kitchen. Now did you, in your inspection of this crime scene, come upon a second glass that also appeared to have the traces of blueberries and whipped cream in it? Yes. And where was that glass? Sitting on the counter in the kitchen. In and the it's kitchen? And it's depicted in photo 262. Could you just, this isn't a grease pencil, but could you just circle that second glass with similar traces? I've done that. Thank you. And showing you 263, is that also a photograph of the kitchen? It is. Is it taken from the opposite end of the island? It is. And do you see the same glass in that photograph? Yes, I do. And would you circle it again? I've done that. And was this glass also entirely intact? Yes, it was. And did this glass also not have any blood or anything else of evidentiary significance on it? It did not. Now, have you ever reviewed uh, these photographs, 250 and the two that I've shown you, with Mrs. Bozanich? I'm sure I have, yes. believing that there was actually berries and cream to such containers in the den at the time the police arrived at the location? Would you look at the last photograph that's in front of you? There are two photographs here. What's the next number? 264. And what does 264 show? It's the an exterior shot, a close-up of the French doors outside the den, uh, depicting a broken uh, glass pane. And does that appear to be a relatively large hole? Yes. And the last photograph? Last photograph is again from the outside of that uh, den, and it uh, is a photo depicting a second hole in a French door window. That's a different hole, correct? That's correct. Getting back for a moment to your inspection of the scene, and particularly the area of the master bedroom and the closets, did you see any currency of any type, whether domestic or foreign, anywhere in that area? Yes. What did you see? I recall seeing uh, American bills. Do you recall seeing any foreign currency, bills, mm -hmm. coins, anything like that? I don't recall. Did you locate Mrs. Menendez's purse anywhere in the house? It was in that dressing room. In which one? In, in the one as soon as you went into that room, so the first dressing room. Do you recall what color it was, the dressing room? No, I don't. And did you find Mr. Menendez's wallet?
I believe I did see it. Where? I don't recall. Wasn't it inside his dressing room on a wooden tray? It could have been. I just don't recall. And didn't that same wooden tray have numerous English coins and bills on it? I don't recall. And didn't that same tray also have about 20 rounds of 22 caliber ammunition? I don't recall seeing that, no. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Any examination on behalf of Lyle Menendez? Any cross-examination? Yeah. All right, thank you. May I step down? Thank you. Yes, I do. Please take your stand and state your name. Eric Galen Menendez, M E N E N D E Z. Mr. Menendez, you've been in this courtroom since the beginning of uh, pretrial hearings and trial, have you not? Yes, I have. Are you aware of the idiosyncrasies of that microphone? If you get too close, it pops. You oh, know that? Yes. If yes. you get too far away, we don't hear you. That's right. Okay. So would you put yourself at a middle distance, if you can? I think you should come in a little closer. Okay, I'm, I'm fine. Okay? All right. Mr. Menendez, where do you live? Los Angeles County Jail. And how long have you lived there? Three and a half years. And during the three and a half years that you have lived there, how long, on how many occasions have you been in sunshine? Ten times. Overall. Ten times? Ten times. And uh, for how long a period on each of those times? Forty, forty-five minutes. And what's the last time you were in any Four, five, six months ago. Is that why you're so pale? Probably. You're not sick? No. You don't no, have any not. skin diseases? No. Do you know who Dr. William Vickery is? Yes. Yes, I do. And how long have you known him? Over three years, three and a half years. And what is he by profession? He's uh, a psychiatrist. And is he someone that you've seen regularly while in the jail? Yes, he's, he's my psychiatrist. He's your psychiatrist? Yes. I think you better come kind of the closest. Thank you. And, uh, does Dr. Vickery have you under a prescription for some medication currently? Yes. And what is the name of the medication? Uh, Xanax. And what is your understanding of what it's for? Objection to rolling. Overall. Uh, for, uh, so that I can sleep and for my nerves. Are you a nervous person? Sometimes. And how often are you supposed to take the Xanax? Twice a day. And are you supposed to take it at night for sleep? Yes. Did you take it last night? Yes. Did you take it the night before? The night before, yes. Now, are you also supposed to take it during the day? Yes, I am. Have you not taken it today? No, I haven't. And are you planning on taking it during the day so long as you test with us? Yes. You are? I'm, I'm planning on it, yes. Do you know if you will? No. Do you have some concerns about taking it while you're testifying? Yes. And why don't you tell us what those concerns are? Uh, I've been told that when you take Xanax... Um, oh, let me ask you something. Does it make you sleepy? Yes. Are you reluctant to take it? when you need to be awake? Yes. Were you aware of the fact, Mr. Menendez, that in 1987, 1988, and 1989, your mother took Xanax? Yes. Do you know what the dosage is, what the size of the pill is of the Xanax that you're supposed to take? Yes. What is it? Uh, 0.25. 0.25 milligram? Yeah. A quarter of a milligram? Yes. 
And that makes you sleepy? Yes. Did you, uh, strike that. How long, um, strike that. What's the first day that you resided in the Los Angeles County Jail? March 11th, or the night of the 10th, or the 11th, um, 1990. And was that the day that you were arrested? Yes. And where were you arrested? At the uh, uh, L.A. airport. Los Angeles International Airport? Yes. And uh, did Detective Zoller arrest you there? Yes, he did. <laughs> and how did you come to be at Los Angeles International Airport? I uh, flew in from Mi Miami and London. And where had you started out on that journey? I was in Israel playing tennis. And was your coach Mark Heffernan in Israel with you? Yes, he was. And did you fly from Israel to some place and then stop? I flew from Israel to London. And then from London to? Miami. And from Miami to? LA. Now, did something happen? Did you hear something in Israel that caused you to make that flight? Yes, I did. And what had you heard? Uh, my roommate um, called me and told me that my brother had been arrested. And your roommate's name was? Uh, Noel Nedley. And was Noel Nedley a man? Yes. And did, you, did Noel tell you, or did you understand what your brother was arrested for? I think he, I think he told me, yeah. You knew it was for killing your parents? Yes. And when you learned that your, uh, and did you know your brother was charged or being charged or held on a murder charge? Well, I, I assumed. I mean, I knew it was for the killing of my parents, so I... So you knew it would, the charge would be murder? Yes. Did you learn before you left Israel that allegations had been filed against your brother of special circumstances that made it a potential death penalty case? Yes. No, I'm not sure I knew that before I left Israel, but I knew that in London. You knew at least that was the potential charges? Oh, yes. Yes, I knew that. And how soon after hearing that your brother was arrested uh, did you decide to leave Israel and come back to the United States? Immediately. And did you expect that when you came back, you would also be arrested? Yes. Did you understand there was a warrant out for your arrest? Uh, yes, I did. And did you understand you'd be arrested for the same thing your brother was being held on? Yes. Did you ever consider during that period of time running away? No. Did you consider hiding? No. Did you consider fighting extradition from either Israel or England? No, I didn't, I didn't want to fight extradition. Why? Because I wanted to be back with my brother. Why? Mr. Menendez, you've heard the testimony of your brother that you and he killed your parents on August 20th, 1989. Did you not? Yes, we did. And what do you believe was the originating cause of you and your brother ultimately winding up shooting your parents? Um, me telling. You telling what? Me telling Lyle that, uh... You telling Lyle what? <laughs> was it you telling Lyle about something that was happening? My dad. <laughs> okay. Oh. My dad. 
Corona, can I ask a leading question? My, if you don't uh, ask my dad. <laughs> Wait one second, Mr. Hayes, is okay? Let me ask No, no, he was in the process of answering, so there's no need to ask him. Can you answer the question? Yes. Okay, was you telling Lyle what? That my dad had been molesting me. And did you want something from your brother? Is that why you told him? I just I wanted it to stop. Were you seeking help from your brother? Yes. And when you were in Israel in 1990, did you feel that seeking help from your brother was why your brother was in jail? Yes. In the summer of 1989, Mr. Menendez, did you live with your parents, Jose and Mary Louise Menendez? Yes, I did. And how old were you? I was 18 years old. And had you always lived with your parents your whole life? Yes. You had never been sent away to school, boarding school, or anything like that? No. Had you on a couple of occasions gone away to camp for a week at a time? Yes. Other than that, did you always live with your folks? I guess I did. And in fact, as of that summer of 1989, had you taken all of your vacations with your parents? Yes. Had you ever been an exchange student or studied away from the city in which they lived? No. During the years 1986, 1987, 1988, were you aware of the fact that your mother was in a noticeable emotional state a lot? Yes. Were you aware of the fact that your mother took medication? Overruled as to that question. Yeah, I knew she took medication. Did you see her doing that? Yes. What's, what was the form of the medication that she took? Was it a liquid? Was it pills? It was pills. During the summer of 1989, did that change? Yes. Did you see your mother taking her medication during that summer, or did you notice that she wasn't? No, she had stopped taking it. And had, at the same time that you realized she had stopped taking the medication, did you see any increase in her very emotional states? Yes. Mr. Menendez, during the summer of 1989, were you being sexually molested by your father? Yes. And when did that begin? How old were you? I was six years old. Now, you have seen You've seen a series of photographs that we put up on the board some weeks ago. The series is 223. Why don't you look through those and tell me if you remember seeing those when they were last put up in this trial. Yes. Are those pictures of your sixth birthday party? Yes. 
other scenes of that day? Yes. Now, do you know, can you remember whether or not the molestation began before or after your sixth birthday party? Um, I was right around then. I believe it was just after. Excuse me? I believe it was just after. After? Mm-hmm. And where were you living at the time? Uh, Muncie. You've seen the chart that we have used to identify the houses? Yes. Do you recognize the Muncie house from that chart? Yes. And was that house in quite a wooded area? Yes, it was. Can you say, Mr. Menendez, that you Can you say that you actually remember your sixth birthday party? No. You don't? I, I remember a birthday party, but I mean... But you don't know if you remember that one? No. Excuse me. Mr. Menendez, do you recall seeing a photograph in this series of your body naked? Yes. Do you remember that photograph being taken? Um, I remember a lot of photographs being taken. And I don't remember that specific one. The types of photographs, well, your, your parents both took a lot of photographs of you and your brother, is that right? Yes. Do you remember naked photographs being taken? Yes. And who would take the naked ones? My dad. But you don't remember that specific one being taken? No. Do you recall when it was that you first saw or shown that naked photograph of yourself? Um, just before I got to court. With why you've been in jail? Yes. How long, from the, from the time you were six when you say your father started to molest you, um, how long did that go on? 12 years. And were there episodes of sexual activity with your father over that last summer? Yes. Over the course of the 12 years, did the type of sexual activity that your father engaged in with you vary and change? Yes. Were there patterns to the behavior so that there were actually different kinds of sexual incidents with your father? Objection Overall. Yes. And did you come over the years to give those different kinds of sexual incidents names? Yes. And would you tell us what were the names that you gave to those different types of incidents? Um, knees, uh, knees, knees, K N E E S. Yes. That was one type. Yes. What was another type? Um, nice sex. Nice sex. Nice sex. 
What was another kind? Um, rough sex. Rough sex. And was there another kind still? Yes. And what name did you come to give that kind? Just sex. You called that sex? Yes. And was that that you called sex some form of intercourse? Yes. When before your father died was the last incident of what you called sex? Um, in May. Of what year? 1989. And when before your father died was the last incident of knees? In August. Of what year? 1989. And that last incident of knees took place in what location? My bedroom. The bedroom that Detective Zoller was just identifying photographs of? Yes. Over the course of those 12 years between age 6 and age 18, where did most of the sexual incidents with your father take place? In my bedroom. Starting at which house? In Muncie. And did episodes of sexual activity between yourself and your father also take place in the next house you lived in on Mill Road? Yes. And did similar incidents occur when you lived in the house in Pennington on Lakeshore Drive? Yes. And were there incidents in the fancy house on Mountain Avenue in Princeton? Yes. And were there incidents in the rented house in Calabasas? Yes. And were there incidents in the big mansion in Beverly Hills? Yes. Can you just put this in the picture? I'm just going to show it to you. This is the naked picture of you that you were testifying about? Yes. Does it embarrass you, this picture? Yes. What exhibit number was that? Your Honor, that one is um, 232. The summer of 1989, Mr. Menendez, what did you do for the bulk of that summer? I played tennis. I played tennis. I and pl you played tennis? Yes. Did you play tennis at home or were you traveling? I was traveling. And you were traveling to what? Uh, tennis tournaments. And were these tennis tournaments in different places? Yeah, they were in San Francisco, uh, they were in uh, Kentucky and Michigan. And was this series of tournaments part of the junior national competition that occurs every year? Yes. And what is the last place that the junior nationals is played every year? In Kalamazoo, Michigan. When did you start traveling to these tournaments that summer? July. And the first place was? In San Francisco. And did you stay in a hotel with your parents during that part of the tournament? Yes. And do you remember what town or area that hotel was in? I believe it was in Burlingame. Burlingame, California? Yes. Now let's turn to the last part of this travel in Kalamazoo. What month was the play in Kalamazoo? 
the tournament in Kalamazoo, the uh, end of the Nationals? It was in August. Now, how were you doing that summer, tennis-wise, in the tournament? In which tournament? Well, let's start with, how'd you do in San Francisco? I did pretty well in San Francisco. And the next stop was Kentucky? Yes. What city? Louisville. Louisville, Kentucky? Louisville. How'd you do at Louisville? I did great at Louisville. And after you did great at Louisville, did you sense what your parents' expectations were for the next round? Yes. And what did you sense about their expectations for the next round? Uh, they wanted me to win uh, Kalamazoo. And what does winning Kalamazoo mean? Winning, ca ca the na it was called the national tournament and it was the biggest tournament um, of the year, every year. And uh, when you won it, you got a berth into the US Open. But how many other tennis playing teens were in that tournament? How many other kids were in it? 128. It was the top 128 kids in the country would compete in that tournament. And going into the tournament, were those 128 already ranked based on their previous uh, tennis play? Yes. And do you know what you were ranked going into Kalamazoo? Not quite sure. I think I was ranked 44. I, I know that was my end up ranking, somewhere around 40. And when you say your parents expected you to win it, does that mean they expected you to go from 44 to 1? Well, not necessarily go from 44 to 1 in the rankings, but win the tournament. In other words, beat everybody and wind up the number one player in that tournament? Yes. Now, there was some youngster ranked one, wasn't there? Yes. And two? Yes. And all the way, there's 43 people ranked higher than you? Yes. Did you feel it was uh, that you could do that, that you were going to win Kalamazoo? No. Why not? Because I, I wasn't good enough to win Kalamazoo. And did you say that to your parents? Now, don't expect me to win this. I'm not good enough. No. Why no. not? Uh... Well, my dad and my mom wanted me to win Kalamazoo, so I told them I, I would play my, my hardest, and my dad said, no, you, you want to win it. So you wouldn't say to him, Dad, that's not realistic? No. In fact, over the course of your entire life, did you feel that your parents had expectations for you? Yes. And did you ever feel those expectations were perhaps too high? Yes. And did you ever tell them, I can't do what you want me to do? No, I, I don't remember saying that, and I wouldn't have. You wouldn't have? No, I, I wouldn't say that. Did you play hard at Kalamazoo? Yes. Did you train in addition to the actual matches? Were you on the tennis court playing and training in between? In the morning and at night, uh, before and after the match. And was the weather particularly difficult during that tournament? Uh, yeah. What was yeah. it like? It was, there was a heat wave going through, and uh, there was a heat wave when I was playing in Kentucky, and then uh, continued over when I was in Michigan. It was and pretty hot. Did that make it difficult for you to play in Michigan? Yes, it made it difficult for everyone to play. Had you been training hard and working hard all summer? Yes. What kind of physical shape did you feel you were in in Kalamazoo? <coughs> I, by the time I got to, when I started the summer, I was in fantastic physical shape. But after having to play uh, and train every day for, I don't know, six or eight hours a day throughout the summer, until I got to Kentucky, I was in good shape. But when I was in Kentucky, I uh, almost passed out on the court because it was, it was too hot. And I, I played like nine or ten matches in a period of like five days. And so I was... I was exhausted by the time I got to Kalamazoo, so I wasn't in the shape I wanted to be in when I got there. How'd you do at Kalamazoo? I did really bad. I did pretty badly. And was there a reaction on the part of your father to the way you played Kalamazoo? Yes. And was this a reaction you had seen in the past, or was it different? Uh, 
it was different. Now, in the past, if you had lost a tournament, how would your father react? He would get uh, extremely angry and, uh, and yell, sometimes hit me, or, uh, um, or have uh, some sort of sex with me. Sex was a punishment? Yes. Was it always a punishment or only when you were a teenager? Only when I was a teenager. And did he have an angry reaction when you lost in Kalamazoo? Yes. How was it different than the previous angry reactions when you lost? Well, I've never seen him not be able to speak. Um, he got so angry and his muscles tensed up and his face tensed up to such a degree that he, he could no longer talk. And where were you when you saw this reaction of his? I was in the car. And the car going from where to where? Uh, from, the, from the tennis court to my uh, hotel. And did you find that, what was your reaction to his getting so angry he couldn't even yell at you? I was, I was, I was scared. I didn't know what he was going to do. I'd never seen that happen before. I can't hear you. I didn't know what he was going to do. I'd never seen that happen before. And uh, what he was saying uh, scared me. What did he say that scared you? He said that uh, he was yelling and telling me how awful I'd played and telling me that everything that I'd ever played for uh, came down to this one tournament, which I failed, and that everything I had ever played in any match I'd ever practiced for was meaningless now because this was the tournament. This was the tournament. And it was my last junior national tournament. And, uh, and he was telling me that I failed. And, um, and to the point where he could no longer speak. So that's what he said before he could, could no longer speak. Yeah. And did you think that there would be serious consequences to his anger? Yes. Did you know what they would be? No. Now, before this loss and his anger, was there a plan for you and your mother and your father to go somewhere from Kalamazoo together? Yes. And where were you all supposed to go? Um, we were supposed to go up to Canada to see um, my grandfather. And that's your mother's? My mom's father. Was he ill? He was dying of cancer. And from what you could observe and what you heard, was your mother anxious to go see her dying father? Yes. And after you lost at Kalamazoo, um, was there some change in that plan? Yes. And ha what was the change? My dad said that uh, he and I were not going to Canada, and that we were going back to uh, California. And how did your mother react to that? Well, he told my mom that uh, if, if she wanted to go, she'd go alone, and that, uh, that, that I and he were, were going back to California, and there were no argument about it, no questions about it. Now, your mother declined to go to Canada by herself, is that right? Yeah, she said that she wasn't going to go if my dad wasn't going to go. And therefore, were plane tickets for Los Angeles purchased for the three of you? Yeah, I assume. Did you all three return to Los Angeles on August 9th via United Airlines? Yeah, I believe that was the date. And when you got back to Los Angeles on that day, uh, did you see your brother Lyle? Yes. And to the best of your knowledge, had he been in Los Angeles some time before you got back? Yes. Now, did you have some hope or dream or expectation over that summer of 1989 for some improvement in your life? Uh, I had it for a lot longer than that. But you had it that summer as well? Yes. And first of all, what was it that you wanted to improve in your life? I wanted to, uh, to end the uh, sex with my dad. And did you have some expectation of how that was going to happen? Yes. And what did you expect? I was going to go to college. And how was that going to end the sex with your dad? I was going to get away from him. 
and uh, and I wasn't going to sleep at the house anymore. Now, what college were you uh, expecting to go to? At that time, UCLA. And where were you expecting to live when you went to UCLA? On campus. In? In the dorm. Just a regular, ordinary dorm? Yeah. Now, had you wanted to go farther away to college? Yes. Where had you wanted to go originally? Um, I wanted to go to Brown. And where is Brown? In Rhode Island. Did you have any friends going to Brown? Yeah. Um, uh, Andy Pierce was going to Brown, and we had made plans before to go to Brown together. You and Andy Pierce? Mm-hmm. Is that yes? Yes. And did you apply to Brown? Yes, I did. Did you apply to a lot of schools? Yeah, I applied to something like 13 or 15 schools. And were you, um, did you go to Brown for an interview? Yes. And uh, did you have contact with the tennis coach at Brown? Yes. Was it your, what role, if any, did you think tennis might play in your being accepted at Brown? Uh, I thought it would, I wasn't going to get into the college without tennis. Um, what does that mean? Well, the Ivy Leagues don't have scholarships like UCLA does and, and uh, the state schools, so you can't, they can't just get you in if you don't have the grade point average. And, uh, and so I had to have a minimal grade point average to get into the school. And, uh, but if you have the minimal grade point average, you don't usually get into the school. So I had to have the coach's help, and, uh, and he was going to get me into the school um, as long as I had that grade point average. In other words, if you had just been applying as, you know, someone who was totally non-athletic, the minimal grade point average would not get you in as compared to the other candidates for entry. Is that what you're saying? No, the minimal grade, yeah, the minimal grade point yes. average, yes. Okay. So you thought you needed to trade on your tennis skills to get into Brown? Oh, well, I knew that. And was there a point when the next step, if you were actually going to try to get accepted by Brown, uh, the next step would have been taken when someone vetoed your plan to go to Brown? Someone said you couldn't go? Oh, my dad said I couldn't go. And that was after you had already applied and already started the process? Yeah, well, it was after the coach called me and, uh, and told me that he needed to confirm that if I got in, I would go. Uh, because apparently they have, like they can get two players in or, or something like that, each coach of every sport, uh, as long as they have the minimal grade point average. And he said, if I get you in, you gotta promise me you'll go. And that's when I uh, had to talk it over with my dad. And he said, Dad. He said, no. Was there also some discussion in the family, which included your mother, about your going to the University of California at Berkeley? Yes. Had you been accepted uh, by the University of California? Amazingly so, yes. Uh, more than one campus accepted you? All the UC campuses accepted me. And do you think tennis had anything to do with that? I don't know, and that's what I'm amazed about, because I never talked to the coaches, and I didn't have the grade point average to get into them. I just assumed it was because I put down a Spanish name or something. Well, you, have you seen any of the applications that your mother made out for you for college? Yes. Did she identify you as Hispanic on those applications? Yes. And indeed, you are in part, are you not? Yes, yes. So was there conversation about your perhaps going to Berkeley? My mom wanted me to go to Berkeley. And did you uh, have some sense of why your mom wanted you to go to Berkeley? Yeah. What was that? She didn't want me around the house. Um, she wanted me to go to far away to Berkeley. She wanted me to go to Brown. But uh, then uh, once my dad said no, she wanted me to go to Berkeley. 
Were you aware of the fact that your mother had some dreams that when you were gone to college, she could stay with your father all the time, travel with him all the time, never leave his side? Did you hear that sort of thing? Yes. All right, objection sustained as to the form of the question, calling for speculation, and also leading and suggestive. Did you hear your mother talking about what her expectations were after you went off to college? Yeah, she was excited to get um, Lyle and I off to college and, and away from the house so that she could take trips with dad and, and she wouldn't have to let, she didn't want dad to go on business trips alone. And so she would be able to go with dad to business trips and she'd just be able to have the house to herself. And have dad to herself? Yes. Now, how important was this idea in your mind that going to college would end the molestation by your father? How important was it? Yes, how significant a notion was this? It was the most important thing in my life. It was everything in my life. It was all I thought about. Why was it all you thought about? I don't understand. All right. Why was it all I thought about? Yeah. Because it would end the sex, and that's all I thought about. How did you feel at 18? about the fact that your father was having sex with you. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. And what did you think your options were with respect to sex with your father? Uh, options? I had no options. Well, let me ask you this. Did you, over the course of that, uh, well, did you, over the course of the preceding three years, ever consider killing yourself? Yes. And what was the reason, as far as you understood it, why you thought about killing yourself? Because it would end the sex. And that's all I wanted. And had you ever tried to end the sex through confrontation or violence against your father? Yes. Yes? You were violent towards your father? Oh, no, not violence, no. But I said no to him once. You said no once? Yes. How old were you when you said no? I was 17. And was there a reason that you gave him for saying no? Not that I gave him. Was there a reason, though? Yes. What was the reason? I just, I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't, I didn't want it anymore, and I, I was really in a, a bad state that day, and he just walked in the room, and I said no. He walked in the room, and there were certain signals and things that he would do, which we'll get to later, about, that told you that sex was... Counsel, let's not lead the witness. Okay. Were there certain things or signals that he did when he walked into your room that told you that he wanted sex of some kind. Yes. And did any of those things happen on that day when you said no? Yes. Now, without going into the details of it, um, on that particular occasion after you said no, did your father become upset? Yes. And did he do anything violent? Yes. And would you just tell us, not what happened, but just generically, what violent things did he do? He threw me on the bed and uh, went to get a knife and uh, put it at my throat. Put the knife to your throat? Yes. And was there sex with your father that day? Yes. Was it that fourth kind that you called yes. sex? Now, after you returned in the summer of 1989, in August, from Kalamazoo, uh, did you have two separate talks with your father <coughs> concerning your future in college? Uh, yes. Could you tell us, first of all, about the first such talk? Do you remember how it took place? Yes. Well, would you tell us? How, where were you with your father for that first talk? I don't remember uh, what the restaurant's name. I think it started with an H. Um, 
I was out for breakfast uh, with him. At a restaurant? Yes. And do you recall approximately how many days after you returned from Kalamazoo this took place? Just a few days. I can't tell you the exact day. I can't, I can't you tell you. Speak up. I, I can't tell speak you the, I can't tell you the exact day. You were alone with him? Yes. And what did he, uh, what was the conversation about? Uh, it was about what I was going to do uh, in college, after college. It's about what you were going to do in college and? After college. Okay, and what, uh, who was, uh, who was doing the talking? Were you telling your dad what you were going to do in college? No, my father was telling me that uh, um, after college, he wanted, he wanted me to take um, uh, business and economics as my major, and after college, he wanted me to take this, uh, I guess, this special program at UCLA, this business uh, law school program um, that combined it in a certain amount of years. And, uh, and then after that, he said that we were going to, or he was going to move to Florida right at the end of that, and we were all going to go into business. He was going to go into business with me. <laughs> Who's we all? Lyle, Mom, me, Dad. Okay. So he was telling you what your future was going to be? Yes. Is this the future you had planned for yourself? N n no, but I mean, I hadn't really planned a future for myself. You hadn't decided what kind of work or career you were going to do, had you? No, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And was your father presenting this to you as an idea that he wanted you to think about, or was this a done thing? No, this is what I was going to do. Um, and that's why he was talking to me, because I needed to get the grades at UCLA to get into the program. And uh, he was concerned about that. And so he was, he was concerned about that, so he was telling me that I was going to have to really, really, really work hard to get the grades, and, uh, and therefore my tennis was going to have to drop. Okay. And what did he mean by your tennis was going to have to drop? Just that he wasn't sure whether or not I was going to be playing on the team, and uh, he, wasn't, he hadn't decided yet whether or not I was going to be playing tennis at all. I guess it, I, I guess it depended on the grades I was getting. I, um, my sense was that he, was, he hadn't decided, but he wasn't going to let me uh, play tennis anymore. Okay. Now, the team that he's talking about is, which team is that? The UCLA team. And how good a team did UCLA have? They, I think that year they were number one in the nation. I'm not quite sure. A good team? Yes. And had you been promised or assured a place on that team? No. Were you still supposed to be trying out for it? Yes. In fact, Mr. Menendez, were you originally supposed to go somewhere after Kalamazoo, after the Canada trip? Were you slated to go somewhere? Yes, I was. Where were you supposed to go after you visited your dying grandfather? Uh, to a, a tennis camp in Florida. And what was the purpose of your going to a tennis camp at that point? To train for the tryouts of the team. To see if you could be good enough to get on the UCLA team? Yes. So what is your father telling you? Is it, You're not on the team yet, right? Yeah, he was telling me, well, my father expected me to, to make the team if I tried out for it. Um, I guess that didn't work into his calculations, I, I don't know. But uh, he just told me that he hadn't decided whether or not I was going to be playing on the team, that uh, he hadn't decided whether or not I was going to, uh, uh, he wanted me on the team and that he would let me know before uh, tryouts. Now, was this a new experience for you, your father sitting you down and telling you what you were going to do with yourself and your life and your sports and your work and all of that? No. Was this very typical? Yeah, that's what happened. So, did it, however, bother you? In some senses, in some ways. In what way did it bother you? Well, it bothered me because it was a big challenge for me to get on the team. They didn't have a junior varsity team. It was, they cut that program so that it was just the varsity team. There were only like 13 or 14 players that made it. And so it was a big challenge, and I was really working to get on the team. And, 
and I was looking forward to it. But in a sense, it was sort of a relief uh, if the pressure ended. What pressure? The pressure of tennis, of uh, of just just the uh, I, f I felt part of me didn't want to play on the team because I didn't want to have to have the pressure of uh, of winning the matches at the tournament. So, I mean, at the uh, matches that they played. What was the source of the pressure? Was this in your head? Was this the coach of the tennis? Team? No, it was my father. Your Honor, if we're going to take a morning break, this is... All right, we'll take a recess. We'll resume at 20 minutes after the hour. Don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. And we'll resume at 20 after. Mr. Menendez, in addition to telling you what your career was going to be and what you were going to study, did your father say anything about how and where you would live after college and graduate school? Yes. And what did he say about that? Uh, we were going to live in Florida. Who's we? Lyle, my mother, I, and my father. And in what kind of setup, if he described such a thing? Um, I'm not sure if he described the setup then. I know what the setup was, but I don't know if I know that from after or before. I know that it was going to be on some sort of an island uh, and a, a big house with other houses, but I don't remember. If you heard your brother testify about your father talking about purchasing a large area of land, a compound of houses? Yes. Did you know about those plans before you, your parents were killed? Yes. You just don't know if your father mentioned it in that conversation? Uh, well, no. I, I knew that we were going to move to Florida. I don't know if I knew the setup before or after. Before or after what, Mr. Menendez? They died. Okay. Now, after this breakfast discussion with your father, uh, did you go to your mother and s say anything to her about, gee, Dad's got my whole life planned, I'm unhappy with it, to do something? No. Were you ever able to go to your mother for that kind of intervention? No. Why not? Because... You just didn't do that. My mom wasn't going to help. How did you know that? Because she had never helped before. Were there other things your father had decided that you didn't like or didn't want to go along with? Yes. Had you ever shared your desires with your mother? I'm confused. Had you ever told your mother, I'd like to do this, Dad doesn't want me to do this? Maybe when I was real young, but not once I got to be a teenager. Did she ever go against Dad? No. Concerning anything having to do with you? No, she never went against Dad. Did she ever go against Dad concerning anything having to do with Lyle and his life? No. Now, was there another discussion with your father within the week after your return from the tournament in Kalamazoo? Yes. And do you recall where this one took place? Uh, this took place in the study um, in the Beverly Hills house. When you refer to the study, could you give us a further description of that room? It was a, a paneled room. You popped the mic. It was, in a, it was a paneled room uh, similar to these panels. It had a wooden floor and wow. there were two chairs and a sofa and a, and a table, two tables in there. That's not the same room as the den? No. The there den is where your parents were killed? Yes. And what was the topic, what was the basic topics of discussion in the conversation you had with your father in the study? Uh, what courses I was going to take at UCLA. And was this you telling him what courses you wanted to take? No, he had, uh, he had all my course sheets lined up on the uh, coffee table and uh, had his, his writings and his papers. And his papers. Uh, what do you mean by his papers? Well, he had, I guess, written out uh, different courses I could take, and then alternative courses, and then alternative courses to that, and what I would be taking in my second year, and basically how I was going to line up my college years and what courses I was going to take. And did he have some materials from UCLA there that told him what courses were available, what courses were offered? <clears throat> yeah, he had, he had all the course sheets, all the um, I never saw them, so I don't, I don't know. Uh, but, I mean, I saw them when I was in that room with him. What do you mean you never saw them? You, you were going to be the student, weren't you? <clears throat> yes, I was going to be the student. And no one ever gave them to you to look over? 
No, my dad had them. And the papers, you say, these are things that had his handwriting on them? No, they, well, some had his handwriting on papers, and then the other ones with UCLA form sheets and course sheets explaining what all the different courses you could take in your first semester, I guess second semester, and your second year, and so on and okay. so on. Okay. So he had, he had mapped it all out? Yes. And he was telling you what you were going to take? Yeah, we were talking about, I guess it was orientation or registration. Um, I'm not sure if the two were combined. What is registration? When you sign up for the courses. Okay. Go on. And he was telling me that um, we had a problem. We had a problem? Yes, that's, that's how he would talk. Okay, and what was the problem? He said that the problem was that the parents could not be there. Back up from the mic. He said that the parents could not be there at registration. That was the problem? Yes, and so the problem was that if one of the courses that he had lined up for me was filled, that I would have to pick the alternate courses. And so he wanted me to go to a payphone and, uh, and, and call him and tell him what courses would, were available and not, and that's why he had his alternative course sheets. So he expected you to telephone him from registration so that you could tell him what courses you were taking or he could tell you what alternative to take? Which was it? Well, I could tell him what both. I could tell him what courses I could take. And were available. Were available, and therefore he would be able to tell me which courses to sign up for. So he was going to pick which classes that you registered for? Yes. And what else did he say about how you were going to deal with college in that conversation? He told me that he told me that I was going to be staying home uh, a few nights a week. That I was going to have my bedroom uh, where it was, and it was going to be my bedroom. And that he wanted me to come home and uh, and eat and, and study with him several nights a week, so that my grades would uh, would stay up and that he would be able to keep apprised of what was going on. Now, was that a significant piece of information for you? Yes. And how did you react to hearing that he expected you to sleep at home? I asked him what he meant. What he meant I was going to be staying home with my bedroom there and so on. And he said that he, I was going to be sleeping home several nights a week so that I could, at dinner and after dinner, go over my work with him. And I, I, I couldn't accept what he was saying. What do you first. mean you couldn't accept it? You said, no, Dad, I'm not going to do that. Is that what happened? No. I just kept asking him what he, what he, what he meant. I, he, I couldn't accept what he was saying. Why? Because he was saying I was going to have to live at home as well as living at college. and. And what? I, di I didn't expect that. Okay, you didn't expect that. Did you like that idea? I hated the idea. I, Why? I because my my entire dream had been to go to college and to leave home. And uh, and for the last several years, all I thought about was going to college. And uh, and suddenly he was telling me that I was going to be living at home and that the the. Uh, well, what did you think that meant with respect? Well, I finish the answer. Did you finish your answer? No. Go ahead. Uh, and he was going to be telling me that I was going to be living at home and that the, uh, basically the sex was going to continue. Did he say the sex is going to continue? No, he didn't say that, but that's what I knew it meant. That's what you believed it meant? Yes. And how did that make you feel? It, it just, it, it made me feel lost. It made me feel like, like, I can't, I can't, I, it made me feel like the hope that I had was gone and that suddenly I was gonna, this was gonna continue throughout college and I felt like I was, like I was crumbling. I, I couldn't, I felt like nothing mattered anymore, that it was gonna continue. Emotionally, what did you convey to your father during this meeting, if anything? How did you visibly react? I guess I just acted stunned. I, uh, I don't know how I reacted. Did you cry? Uh, no. Did you ask him if you couldn't stay at school or take other classes? No, I knew what he was saying, and, uh, and I knew there was no arguing about it. I asked him what he meant several times, and he, he spelled it out for me pretty clearly, and I, I just realized what he was saying. And do you recall what time of day this particular conversation took place? Yes. When was it? Uh, late afternoon. And 
After that conversation, what did you do? I went up to my bedroom. And what did you do? I just laid in my bed and cried and felt sorry for myself. And what were you sorry about? I was sorry that it was going to continue, that I wasn't going to get away from college, and uh, I just didn't care about life anymore. I didn't care about things that were going to happen. I, I couldn't let this, this go on with my father, and I didn't know what to do. Well, what did you consider? I considered just killing myself. Did you consider killing your father? No, not at that time. Were you feeling angry? Were you feeling depressed? Were you feeling sad? What were you feeling at that point? I was extremely sad. Uh, I felt like nothing mattered anymore. I felt like the one thing that I'd been living for suddenly was taken away from me and I didn't care about life anymore. Was your social life better when you lived in California versus when you lived in New Jersey, or was it worse, or was it the same? It was better. And what was different about your social life in California than when you lived in New Jersey? I had a lot more friends. I was able to go out with my friends. I would, was yeah. able to hang out with my friends, and suddenly I was, I felt more important. I felt, I, you I popped felt the mic. I felt more important. Okay. Did you feel liked by friends? Yes. During those years in California, did, it, did you ever think about what would happen if any of your friends knew? I just... Did you think I, about that? I, I thought about it all the time. And what did you think? I couldn't accept the fact that they might be able to find out. I was never going to let them find out, and that's just all I thought. I never found out. I never thought about what would happen if they knew, because that just was not going to happen. Well, were you concerned about people knowing? Yes. Okay. Did you want them to know, or did you not want them to know? No, I did not want them to know. Why? Overall. <laughs> Why didn't you want them to know? Will you specify what it is that he didn't want to know? Why did you not want them to know that you were a boy who had sex with his father? <sighs> because I didn't want to be humiliated. I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want, I wanted them to like me. I wanted them to think that I was a friend of theirs and I didn't, I just wanted to be one of them. One of the boys? Yeah. Did you think what was happening with you and your father was normal or abnormal? I knew it was extremely abnormal, and I wasn't going to let anyone find out. Did you think what was happening with your father was all his fault, or did you think it was partly your fault? No, I thought it was partly my fault. In what way was it your fault? That I never stopped him, and that I let it go on, and uh, just those reasons. Did you have a high opinion of yourself because of what was going on with your father? A low opinion? No opinion? I thought I was a coward. What I, uh, else? I hated myself for it, and I, uh, I knew I should have stopped it. Okay. Now, what did you do after you went through this period of feeling sad and feeling sorry for yourself? I just cried a lot and uh, decided to leave. To leave? To leave. I decided like, to go over to a friend's house. You mean to leave the house? Yes. And what did you do based on that decision, if anything? I packed my bags. Back up a little. I started to pack a, a big bag, a uh, duffel bag. A big duffel bag? One of my tennis bags. OK. How long were you planning to stay at a friend's house? Just for a few days. And uh, had you ever done that before? I had stayed at a friend's house for a day, but never for a few days, no. Did you think your parents would let you? I really didn't care. So you packed this tennis bag? Yes. Did something happen while you were in the process of packing it? Yes. What happened? My mom came uh, into the room. She knocked on the door, and uh, I opened it, and she saw what I was doing. And, uh, Why didn't she just walk in? Why did you have to open the door? I always kept my door locked. 
Did everybody in that house always keep their doors locked? Yes. And after your mother came in, what happened next? She, uh, she looked at what I was doing and she said, where the hell do you think you're going? Mm -hmm. And I said, just for over a friend's house for a few days. And she said, no, you're not. And she just started throwing the clothes out of the duffel bag. And, um, and what did you do? I just watched. And what happened after that? She screamed uh, and uh, said a few more things about how I wasn't going to leave. And, uh, and then she ran out of the room. She ran out of the room? Marched. Marched? She, she ran and marched out of the room. She left the room in a hurry? Yes. What, was she, what kind of emotional condition was she in when she left? She was very angry. Why was she angry? We had had, the, we had, had a, a fight before, a year before about it. A fight with whom? Who's we had we? an argument um, with my mom uh, a year before, the same sort of argument. About what? About running away. A year before there was an argument about running away? Yes. Well, did you tell your mother on this occasion, I'm running away, I'm going forever? No, that was the year before. On this occasion, where did you tell her you were going? I just told her I was going over to my friend's house for a few days. Did you tell her why? No. Did she ask why? No. So what did the year before have to do with the condition she was in when she left your room? I just knew as soon as she walked in the room that there was going to be a problem and I didn't even bother. I well, couldn't. what was her emotional condition? I'm, I'm not clear. Was she upset? Was she sad? Was she when, in despair? That when her she son walked, walked in the room? When she walked out of the room. Well, she was furious. She was angry. She was angry, yes. Okay. Did you have permission to run away from home? No. Was she angry the year before when you told her you wanted to do that? Yes. And after your mother left the room angry, did someone else come to your room? Yes. And who was that? My father. And uh, did he say anything to you? Yes. What did he say? He asked me if I had a problem, and uh, he asked me what I thought I was doing, and um, pushed me against, he pushed me against the window, and I uh, came up real close, and he said, uh, are you planning on going somewhere? And I said, Now, no. are you remembering this verbatim? You remember every word he said? No, I just remember the feeling that I had and, and uh, what he did. Uh, is this the substance of the conversation? Yes. Okay. And... And what else, if anything, what, what were the other things he said? He told me that he was leaving this week and that uh, I had better be there when I get back. When, when you he, get back? When he gets back. Okay. He said that he was leaving that week and, uh, and that he would deal with me then. Deal with you when? When he got back. And what did that mean to you? I figured uh, what it would mean. I figured that it would mean that uh, he would punish me in some way. Mr. Menendez, you have to sit back. You keep popping the mic. Try to sit back. I figured you. that it would mean he would punish me in some way, and the way he always did. It wasn't what? In the way he always did. <sighs> did he strike you during this uh, conversation? No. And after, I take it he left after telling you he would deal with you when he got back? Yes. And how did you feel after he left? Were you still going to pack and go to a friend's house? No, I just, you see, the state I was in at the time, I just didn't care. It just, after my dad told me that I was, that I wasn't going to get away from him at in essence, instead of going to college, that I was going to have to stay at home several nights a week. I just didn't care. It, nothing seemed to matter to me anymore, and, and life just seemed to, to fold right in front of me. And I, I didn't care whether he hit me. I didn't care whether he, I didn't care whether he killed me. I didn't, it didn't matter to me anymore, because if I wasn't going to get away from, from that, then who cared? And uh, so he did what he wanted. It didn't matter anymore. Well, are those the thoughts that went through your mind after he left? Uh, those were the thoughts that were there the whole day and the next day. Okay. And 
Were you then getting uh, ready to put up with the same activity for the next few years that you had been putting up with for the previous 12? No. What were you thinking of doing? I was thinking of just killing myself. I was in a daze and I didn't know what to do. And I just, I just wanted to die. I didn't, life no longer mattered. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I thought of telling Lyle. I thought of, I thought I couldn't do that. That it would be too embarrassing. And that I couldn't admit it. And I just, I just. <sighs> so two things occurred to you. One to kill yourself, and the other, to tell Lyle? Yes. Over the years, the 12 years, had you ever told Lyle? No. Were you ever accused by your father of having told Lyle? Yes. And approximately when was that? When I was about 11. When you were about 11? Yeah. Lyle would have been 13 or 14? Somewhere right around there. And on that occasion when your father accused you of telling Lau, was it true? Had you told him? No. Now on this occasion, you said you considered telling Lyle. Yes. What do you think Lau could do? I really didn't know. I really didn't. It wasn't a, a thought that I had planned out it was just a thought because I didn't really want to die and I was very afraid that I would and uh, maybe what? it was partly to, to, to tell Lyle because that's what my dad always never wanted me to do I, I, I don't know I, I just I needed help in some way and I just thought about telling Lyle did you think about ways to kill yourself yes what ways did you think about I thought about just hanging myself, I thought about cutting my wrists, I thought about driving off a cliff, something that I wanted to do before. Had you in 1986 and 1987 come across any suicide letters written by your mother? Yes. In any letter of your mother's that you saw, uh, did she ever indicate the methods that she was contemplating using to kill herself? Yes. And what do you recall reading in those letters of your mother? She wanted to shoot herself. Did you come across any letter where she indicated she wanted, she would sit in the bathtub with a razor in her hand and consider slitting her wrists? Yes. Did you picture yourself doing that during this, after this confrontation with your parents? Yes, I had pictured it many times before. Had you thought of suicide before this week? Yes. Now, do you have any memory at all, Mr. Menendez, of what you did the Monday before your parents died? No. Do you have a memory of every single day that summer? No. Do you have a memory, though, of every day after that Monday until your parents died? Yes. Starting then with Tuesday, what do you remember about Tuesday, August 15th, 1989? I remember trying to play tennis in the morning, uh, not, not caring enough about it and, uh, and stopping. What was your general mood that morning? I was just very down, um, very uh, depressed. Okay. Depressed? Yeah. And what else do you recall happening that Tuesday? I recall a fight between my father, I mean my brother and my mother. Now was it, what was your understanding that Tuesday about where your father was? 
he was out of town. And do you know when it was he left? I believe on Monday. Um, I'm not quite sure. Did you usually know in advance when your father was leaving on a business trip? No. Did he go on a lot of business trips? Oh yeah, he went on business trips all the time. And how would you become aware of the fact that he was on a trip? Either my uh, mother would tell me or um, he would call and I'd talk to him on the phone. But he never bothered telling you his schedule, where he was going or when? No. On this week, though, he did actually tell you in advance that he was going on a trip that week, did he not? Yes. Did he tell you specifically when he was leaving and when he was coming back? No, all he told me is that I'd, I'd better be there when he got back. Uh, I didn't know when that uh, really was until I asked my mother. And w what did you learn after asking your mother? When was he due back? Thursday. Now, on Tuesday, what else do you remember besides not being able to practice tennis in the morning? A fight between my mother and my brother. When you say fight, you mean a physical altercation? No, I just mean an argument, um, a lot of yelling. Okay. And where did this argument take place? Uh, right between the den and the foyer. In the house? Yes. Uh, when you entered this house from outside, would you be standing in an open area? Yeah, you were standing in the foyer at that point. That's what you refer to as the foyer? Mm hmm And was there a staircase on the right that went upstairs? Yes. And was there a sort of gallery that cut across halfway into the foyer? Was there like a, a lower ceiling? You mean a balcony? Yeah, the yes, balcony. Yes, the balcony. And were they in the area beneath the balcony? Just in front of it. So to they the were side of the bathroom. Past the balcony, there's another section of the foyer that leads to a bathroom and the den? Yes. So they were closer to the den than the part with the balcony? Yes. And how did you, how did you come upon this argument? Did they come out of a room They came out you? of the den. Okay. And uh, my mom came out first, and she was yelling, and she was saying, you don't need it, I don't care, I don't, I don't care what you want, you're not having it. And Lyle was right behind her, saying, please, please, I need it. It's not that big a deal. I, it, it's important to me. Now, at that point, did you have any idea what they were talking about? No, I had no idea what they were talking about. And do you know where you were coming from? I was coming from my car. Do you know where you had been? I don't remember where I'd been. Okay. And this mom yelling at Lyle, was this a unique experience in your life? No, not at all. And was, how typical was it for your mother to be yelling at Lyle? Uh, she yelled at Lyle all the time. Did she yell at you all the time? Not as much as she yelled at Lyle. And this on this particular occasion, on this Tuesday, was she, did she appear to be angry? Oh, yeah, she was really angry. And was that an unusual condition for her in relation to when she was dealing with Lyle? No, she was usually very angry when she was dealing with Lyle, but she was really angry a lot that summer. Okay. And what happens after you hear this exchange between your mother and Lyle? <sighs> He was, he was just saying, I need it, and she finally, she just took a hold of his hair and, and just ripped it off. What did you think at that point? I, did, I, I didn't know what to think. I couldn't believe it. I, I didn't understand at first, and then it hit me, and then I realized, and I... What, what, what didn't you understand? What hit you? What did you realize? Well, he just pulled off, she just pulled off his hair, and, and I knew he had something done to his hair, but I didn't know what, and... And uh, it, within a moment, I realized that it was a hair piece, but I just couldn't believe it. At first, what did you think it was? I thought it was his hair. You yeah, she was ripping off his scalp, basically? Yes. Now, you said you knew he had something done to his hair. What do you mean by that? Well, I knew that, that his hair was, was beginning to fall out, and, uh, and I had heard about a, a, a conversation that he and Mom and him had, I guess. I don't really remember it that well, but I, I know that 
suddenly he had a full head of hair and it was always neat, always perfect, and I didn't quite understand what had happened. Well, didn't that tell you he wore a toupee? I didn't know really much about uh, those sorts of things. I mean, I knew what a toupee was, but I thought it was obvious when you wore one, and I couldn't imagine that my brother was wearing one. Because it, it didn't seem obvious? I played tennis with him. I, uh, I went swimming with him. It, it did not seem like he was wearing a, a toupee at all. So you thought it was some other method by which his hair was thickened or restored? Yeah, I thought it was some sort of surgery. I didn't, I didn't know exactly what it was. So when you saw your mother ripping his hair off, um, did you react? Yeah, I was, I was pretty shocked. I, was, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I, I just couldn't believe it. And how did he react? How did Lyle react? Uh, he just started to cry. And um, what, if anything, did your mother do after she had taken the toupee off of Lyle? She said, see, um, you look fine, you don't need it, and just threw it at him. Did he look fine to you? No, I, I really couldn't believe it. Um, no. Uh, had looked... you ever seen him like that? No. So what, uh, what did your mother do, if anything, after she threw the hairpiece at Lyle? She ran up the stairs. And what did Lyle do? He, uh, he wouldn't look at me, uh, not that I wanted him to at the time, uh, but he went to the guest house. And what did you do? I eventually went over to the guest house. Now, why did you go over to the guest house at that point? Because I felt really bad for Lyle, and I was feeling pretty bad myself, and I just, just, I'd been wanting to talk to him for two days, and I figured that he couldn't <coughs> have had a more down moment than that, and so I figured I'd just share the moment with him. You were feeling down for two days? Yeah. Did you think if you talk, oh, before this incident, did you think if you talked to your brother, he might make you feel better? Yes. <coughs> did you have a good relationship with your brother at that time? Yeah, I had a very good relationship. Your Honor, it's a two afternoon. All right, we'll take a recess until 1.30, ladies and gentlemen, with this same admonition not to discuss the case with anyone, don't form any final opinions about it, and we'll resume at 1.30. Direct examination. Okay. Mr. Menendez, we were talking about what you did after you saw um, the argument between your mother and your brother. Did you go somewhere? Yes. And where did you go? I went to the guest house. Why did you go there? To talk to Lyle. And did you have in mind what you were going to talk to him about? Not really, just that, you know, I, I understood or I didn't mind that he wore a hairpiece and that I was feeling down too, just, just to talk to him, to comfort him. And when you got to the guest house, did you see your brother? Yes. Where was he? He was in the bathroom fixing his hairpiece. And uh, at some point, did he come out of the bathroom? Yes. Did you start to talk to him? Yes. Can you tell us generally what you were telling him? Is it being offered for the truth of the matter asserted? No, Your Honor. And why is it being offered? It's being offered to uh, as foundation for a conversation that is being offered for truth. Objection sustained. You heard your brother testify that you talked to him about how you wanted to be close to him? Yes. And is that what you said? Yes. And did the conversation then evolve into talking about something else? Yes. And what, where did it evolve to? What else did you talk yeah. about? Again, is this being offered for the truth of the matter asserted? Yes, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Well, I'd like to approach. You may. Thank you. This objection is sustained as far as the form of the question. The uh, answers of the witness in regards to conversations are not being received for the truth of what was said. Just to uh, reflect the state of mind of uh, the defendant witness here, Mr. Eric Menendez, and uh, potentially the state of mind of the person who heard what he said. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Menendez. What did you say to your brother when you first started talking to him in the guest house? I was telling him that, uh, that things in the family didn't seem to be going so well. And it seemed to be 
um, a lot of secrets, um, and that people seem to be we seem to be getting apart, and, and that I didn't want that to happen between Lyle and I. And what else did you say? Just that uh, that I loved him, and and that I didn't want his relationship and mine to separate. Did uh, could you assess what kind of mood your brother was in when you were saying these things to him, from how he looked? Or? Well, after the incident with my mom, he he looked pretty down. Do you think that having his hairpiece torn off in front of you was a thing that would embarrass him? Yes. And did that enter at all? In speak up, I'm sorry. It's the, I've got the mic covered here. Did that enter at all into your decision or desire to go talk to him? Yes. No, I knew he was very embarrassed, and uh, and I wanted to tell him that there wasn't a reason to be. That it wasn't going to change your relationship. No. And then did you start talking about something that you were feeling badly about? Yes. I, uh, I remember asking him if he remembered a conversation that he had with Dad when he was um, a lot younger, when I was 11. And did he respond? Yeah. Uh, he said he didn't know what I was talking about. And I, I asked him several times if he remembered any, anything about conversation that he had had with dad or conversations that he had had with me um, about things that dad was doing to me and he said that he didn't know what I was talking about. So eventually did you clarify what you were talking about? Yeah. What did you say? I told him that things between dad and I were still happening and that uh, and he, he kept he kept asking what I was talking about. So and did you tell him what you were talking finally about? Finally I told him. I told okay. him that they were just sexual things. Sexual things? Yes. Now, why did you tell him that? Why did you bring that up? Because I was feeling, I was feeling really, really depressed and really down, and I didn't, I didn't know what to do at the time. So I figured I'd tell Lyle, and maybe he could help me. Okay. And did he? You heard him testify. You heard your brother Lyle testify that when you told him that sexual things were still going on with you and Dad that he was very nasty towards you. Yeah, he was very angry. And who did he appear to be angry at? He was angry at me. He was asking me why I never told him. He was asking me why I never did anything. He asked me if I enjoyed it, if I, if I liked it, if, if I ever fought back. He, he just didn't understand. He was asking all these questions that were really surprising me. And apart from surprising you, how did the, these angry questions make you feel? They, made, they hurt me. And I was denying him, and I was saying, no, of course not, no, of course not, and I was just trying to make him understand. And at some point, did it appear that he did understand? Yes, he sort of. He sort of changed his tone. Okay, and <clears throat> did he indicate to you, uh, after he changed his tone, uh, any uh, plan or any decision that he was making? I could tell he was now just trying to understand where I was I was coming from. He was asking me who knew. He asked me if Mom knew. Okay, and what did you say when he asked you if Mom knew? Oh, I told him, of course Mom didn't know, that if she would have known, she didn't know. And is that how you felt at that time, that your mother did not know? Yes. And did you ask him to do anything for you. I'm sorry. Did you ask your brother to do anything? You're telling him how badly you feel about this, right? Yes. You're telling him you don't want it to go on? I don't remember if I told him that exactly. Um, I, I'm sure I conveyed it to him because uh, he started talking about how it was not going to happen again. And he started to get really, really angry. And uh, he was... He was really upset and saying that it wasn't going to happen again. And I was saying, you know, I didn't know. Dad said it was going to keep happening. And I was really worried about it going on when he went away. And he said, I don't have anything to worry about, that it's not going to happen again. And Did he tell you anything else that was going to change besides that this wasn't going to happen? Again? Yes. What else did he say was going to change? He said that I was going to go to Princeton with him. He said that if I couldn't get 
into Princeton that I was just going to live with him over there. And did he tell you how these changes were going to come about? Yes. And what did he say? He said he was going to talk to Dad. Talk to Dad about what? About the stuff that had happened between Dad and I. He said it was going to stop and that uh, I shouldn't worry about it because it was going to end and he was going to make sure of it. And did he seem confident when he said these things? Yeah, he seemed really optimistic, too optimistic. Did you feel as optimistic as he seemed? No, I, I, I was trying to tell him, you know, Dad's going to be a little bit more upset than you think. Dad's, Dad's not going to be too happy about you telling him this information. And he said, no, no, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. It'll be fine. And he was really, I was just trying to warn him, but not too much. What do you mean you weren't trying to warn him too much? Well, I was, I was really afraid that if I told him all that was happening, that he might not talk to Dad and just leave me there. And so I didn't want him to get worried about it, that Dad would, might react badly. So I wanted to just tell him that Dad might not like what he's going to tell him. And uh, I wanted Lao to understand it a little bit more, but I didn't quite want to tell him. What was it you didn't want to tell him? Was there something your dad had said to you repeatedly? Yes. I didn't want to tell him that uh, dad said he would kill me if I ever told anyone, and he was serious, and I just thought it might scare him off. Scare who off? Lyle off. So you didn't tell him that? No. And at that time on Tuesday, did you tell your brother any of the details of what the sexual activity between yourself and your father was? No. You didn't tell him about knees or no. nice or rough or sex? None of that. And did you tell him anything about the violent component of your sexual activity with your father? No. Was there a reason why you didn't tell him that? There were two reasons. I, 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 one, I didn't want to scare him off. And two, I just didn't want to, didn't want to tell him about it. Was it easy or difficult for you to admit to your brother that this was going on? It was very hard for me. Were you eager or reluctant to give him any specifics of the kind of things that you and your father had been doing? I was, I was very reluctant. I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't want to have to go into it with him. I was, uh, it was, he was my brother and I felt really ashamed that I would have to uh, talk about the fact that it was still happening with him. Now, at the end of this conversation on Tuesday, um, did your brother tell you what he had decided he would do to help you? Yes. And what did he tell you he had decided to do? Well, he said that he was going to talk to Dad. Now, you encouraged him to do that, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I did. Could you think of anything else that you might do for help at that point besides Lyle's offer to talk to your father? No, there was nothing I could do. Were you apprehensive or worried about how the talk might come out? I was very nervous. I, uh, I was really nervous about how Dad would react. I was I really didn't think Dad was going to react well, but I was, I was hoping that he might. I was hoping that Lyle might do what he seemed like he said he was going to do. Had you noticed over the years that your father spent um, a fair amount of time talking with your brother? Yes. Did you believe that your father and your brother had a different relationship than you had with your father? Yeah, he had a much different relationship. And as you were growing up, um, did you feel that the family as a whole had some respect for a while? <laughs> what did you think of your brother's intellectual ability? I thought he was very, very intelligent and... Um, was that just your view or did, did anybody else in the family share it? Uh, that's what my dad and my mother thought. And uh, 
What did you think of Lyle's verbal skills? Well, he was good in, in all of that. He was, he was intelligent, he was a good speaker, he, he knew how to talk, and I figured that he would know how to talk to Dad. If he seemed confident, maybe there was a reason for him to be confident. And uh, he knew Dad a lot better than I did in that respect. Now, do you remember anything occurring the next day on Wednesday? Yes. Do you remember going to lunch with your brother as he testified? Yes. And what was the topic of conversation at that lunch? How I was going to live with him. And uh, he, either he, was, he decided that either I was going to go to Princeton with him or he was going to come and live with me at UCLA. And, uh, and he, seemed, he seemed excited about that. Um, was that a prospect that you relished as well? Yeah. Yeah, I thought that would be great. Uh, although I was trying to tell him that he shouldn't be so optimistic. But did you, at, on that occasion, tell him um, about your father's threats or his violence or any of that? No, I didn't. Again, I didn't tell him about it uh, at all. What were? You, what did you think might happen, if anything, if you actually had told your brother at that point the specifics about how? violent your father had been? I didn't know, but I was worried about him getting scared off or him just not talking to Dad at all and leaving me there with him. And that's what my biggest fear was. And I I, I did the wrong thing. I just told him uh, none of it. Now, was there also, <clears throat> during that lunch, uh, did your brother mention to you um, anything about a talk that he had had with your mother earlier that day. Yeah. What, uh, what did he tell you? He said that he talked to, to mom and told her that uh, he wanted to talk to dad when dad got home about me. OK, and, uh, now did you respond to that? Yeah. What did you say? I, I said you didn't tell him about what I told you. You didn't tell who? Mom. OK. I, I was asking Lyle if he told mom about what I told to him that happened between Dad and I, and and and, and, and did he respond? Yeah, he said no. I was real worried about that. Um, he told you he hadn't told her. Yeah, he told me he had not told her. Now your worry, if he had told Mom, was what? What were you what What were you afraid of? If he had told Mom, what What were you worried about? I don't know. I, I I'm not really quite sure. I just was. Uh, I wanted I wanted Lyle to talk to Dad, but I was really afraid of it too. And it just seemed like if he told Mom that, then the talk would have to happen. And in a sense, but I didn't why, want. It. Why would the talk have to happen if he told your mother? Because if he told Mom, I would have done the one thing that he always told me never ever to do. And I just was worried about doing that. Mr. Menendez. If your brother had told your mother, what did you think your mother would have done? Oh, she would have talked to my dad. OK. Even though he was out of town? Yes. Did they talk every day, as yes. far as you knew? No, he always called home. Did your mother tend to talk to your father more than once a day? Yes. Was that true for as long as you All lived my in life. that family? And. Based on your experience in the family, did your mother tell your father everything that you guys were up to? Sustained. Was it your experience that if something happened, if you had done something wrong or got into trouble, did your father know about it, even if he wasn't home when it happened? Yes. And did your mother over the years ever say anything about telling your father what was going on in the house when he wasn't there? She would always threaten to tell Dad, and sometimes she'd do it right in front of me at the dinner table, or I could hear it in their bedroom, or when he got home. Otherwise, she would just threaten, if you do this, I'm going to tell your father, or... With respect to things you actually did that upset her or, annoy her, or annoyed her, did it appear from your father's reactions that she always told him? Yes. Did you feel that you could trust your mother to keep information from your father? No, definitely not. Did you not. ever feel that way? No. Mr. Menendez, just for a moment, I want to 
change the subject. Did you hear some of your teachers testify in this trial about an auditory processing problem that you have? Yes. And were you aware you had, uh, were you aware of the fact when you were uh, in school that you had a problem? No. You didn't, you didn't know you had a problem following instructions or? Oh, I knew I had a problem doing that, but I didn't know that what the I cause had an was. auditory um, problem like that, no. You knew you had problems understanding, but you didn't know what it was due to? Yes. Now, you have learned in the past three and a half years that you had this problem. Yes. Objection sustained, the answer is Have you learned in the past three years since you've been in jail by looking at various materials anything about having such a problem? Yes. Do you think you still have it? Yes. And is this the kind of problem where you know that you don't understand what you're hearing, or do you think that you do understand what you're hearing? If you, you look puzzled. You don't understand the question, do you? I think so, yes. <laughs> OK. You didn't understand the question? No. All right. Is it, has it been your experience that you'd hear something and you thought you understood it and only found out later that you got it wrong? Yes. Are you trying to listen carefully? Yes. Now, at the end of the talk on Wednesday with your brother Lyle, did you feel apprehensive about Thursday? Yes. Were you sorry you had told him at that point? Were you glad? Were you not sure? I wasn't sorry I told him. I was uh, uneasy about it, but I was glad that I told him. He, he, he was nice at that point to me, and, uh, and he seemed optimistic, and I was hoping that things would be OK. Had your brother been nice to you for some time up to that point? Yes, we, we, we had a good relationship up to that point. And how would you rate your relationship with the other family members? Who among the three of them, your father, your mother, or your brother, did you have the best relationship with? Lyle. And how long had that been true? Many years, uh, since I was 13, 12. And who among the other members of your family was nicest to you? Lyle. Turning to Thursday, were you home in the early part of the day, you think? Um, yes, I believe I was. I was playing tennis. And were you playing tennis with someone else? Yeah, my coach. Mark Heffernan? Yes. And where did you play tennis with him on Thursday? In the backyard. At home? Yes. And your father was expected home from the trip when? Late afternoon, uh, early evening. Like around Did six. you have a specific time that you knew about? Yeah, I think it was about 6. I think that was the time that I had in my head at the time. Sometime later in the day after you had your tennis lesson with Mr. Heffernan, uh, did you leave the house as your brother has testified? Yes. And did you come back real late? Yes. And why did you stay away? I, I just wanted not to be home when Lyle was having the conversation with Dad. And uh, so I stayed away and kept calling in to see if he had had the conversation. And he kept telling me it had been delayed, so I stayed away longer. The conversation was delayed, or your father's return was delayed, or what? My dad's return. And you learned that by calling Lyle? Yes. Now, your brother testified that there were three lines in the house, three different telephone lines, but they all rang, at least in the main house. Yes. In more than one location in the main house. Yes. And when you called in on Thursday, you called which line? Lyle's line. And did he pick it up each time? Uh, every time except for one. 
And on that one time, who picked it up? Mom. And what did you do when Mom picked it up? I hung up. Why did you hang up? I just didn't, I didn't want to talk to Mom. I didn't, um, I just didn't want to talk to her at the moment. And over the course of these calls, with you calling in, did the time for your father's return change at all? It got later and later and later, and I didn't understand why, but it just got later. Now, at some point late that night, did you go back home? Yes. And who was the first member of your family that you came in contact with after you went back home? Dad. And where were you when you came in contact with your father? In my bedroom. And how did the contact with your father begin? Uh, he was banging on my door you know, with his fist. And did you, did he say anything? Did you hear him? Yeah, he was, he was yelling for me to open up the door. Uh, he was saying, open the goddamn door now. And what was your feeling when you heard him and heard the pounding? Uh, I, I, was, I was terrified. Uh, my heart was pounding, and I, uh, I didn't want to open up the door. What did you think, if anything, had happened? Did you think there had already been a talk with Lyle? Did you think there hadn't been the talk with Lyle? What did you think? From, from Dad's reaction, I thought there had been a talk with Lyle. And uh, could you tell from the way his voice sounded and the pounding whether he was in a good mood, a bad mood, happy, sad? No, he was, he was really upset. Uh, upset meaning? He was yelling. He was furious. It sounded furious. Angry. Angry. Now, what did you do after you heard your father yelling and pounding on the door? He was demanding that I open it, I unlock it, and, uh, and so I did quietly. Okay. You unlocked the door? I just unlocked the lock uh, and went back to the back of my bedroom. You didn't open the door for him, in other words? No. <clears throat> Why did you do that? Because I wanted to have time to get back in, into the corner of my bedroom. And if I might approach, Your Honor. Excuse me. Showing you the photograph that's previously been marked 257. Do you recognize what that is? Yes. Yes. And what is that? That's one of the corners of my bedroom. And is that the corner you retreated to after you had unlocked the lock on your door? Yes. And what was it about being in that corner that led you to go there? It's just that it, it was like a good uh, retreat place because what? the bed and my desk met, and so you couldn't get there very easily. In other words, there was a narrow space between, the desk is here, is it not? Yes. And this is? My bed. And was it narrow between the two? Yes. Yes. What were you expecting? I didn't quite know what would happen, but I figured he would attack me in some way or hit me or do something. Had he hit you before in your life? Yes. Had he done other physical things that hurt you when angry? Yes. Um, what kind of thing? What was the thing he most typically did when he was angry? I, he Most typically, he slapped me. And what about pushing your body into objects, would he do that? Yeah, he'd throw me a lot. Throw you a lot? Yes, he'd throw me into the wall or into the bed or into the desk or into the glass or any place. He once threw you into a glass door, didn't he? Yes. Broke the door? And shattered the glass. And then threw you again? Yeah. By right through it, right? Mm-hmm. So when he came into the room on this occasion, uh, what was the first thing that happened? Uh, he started yelling at me. Can you give us generally what he was saying? He was saying that he had, he had told me never to tell Lyle and that he had warned me not to do that. And, and now uh, he said that Lyle was going to tell everyone and, and that uh, it was my fault. And, and now 
Lyle was going to tell everyone and he was not going to let that happen. He was not going to let what happen? He said he wasn't going to let Lyle tell Well, he didn't say he wasn't going to let Lyle anyone. He just said he wasn't going to let that happen, Lyle telling anyone. Now, you say he said he told you in the past what? Well, he had told me never, ever to tell anyone. And did he ever tell you what the consequence would be of telling anyone? He would kill me. And did he seem the way he had sounded outside the door, furious, angry? Seem inside the door? Yeah, when he was inside, did he look and sound the way you thought he was? Did oh, yeah, he, he was angry. He was more angry than I'd ever seen him. He was angry. And what did he do after he made these statements to you? Uh, well, I started saying, no, he's not going to tell anyone, I promise, and he just told me to shut up and, and just rush toward me. And did he come in physical contact with you? Yeah, he grabbed me as I was trying to get over the desk. Okay. You were trying to climb over the desk? Yeah, I was trying to jump over the desk because I, I just wanted to get away from him at that point. And he somehow stopped you from jumping over the desk and did what? Well, he grabbed me and threw me on the bed. Okay. And then did he try to do something to you while on the bed? Yeah, he was grabbing toward me and I was able to just to fling my body away and run out the door. So you got away from him? Yeah. And where did you run to? Downstairs. And did you go into a particular room downstairs after you got down the stairs? Yeah, I just ran into the den. And did you think there was anybody in the den? Yeah, I thought, I thought there might be somebody in the den. The television was on. And was there, in fact, anybody in the den? Yes. Who? My mom. What was your mother doing in the den? She was sitting on the couch watching TV. She just looked over at me. And what condition were you in when you got into the den? Do you uh, know? I, I was crying. And did she say anything to you? Did she make any comment to you? Yeah, she said, what's the matter with you? And what uh, did you respond to her when she said that? Yeah, I said, no, nothing. You won't understand. You said? I said, no, nothing. You won't understand. And did she say anything to that? Yeah, she said something like, oh, oh I understand. I understand a lot more than you think. Well, what did you say when you heard? Well, first of all, what did you think when you heard that? I couldn't, I, I thought that she was saying that she knew what was happening between Dad and I, but I, I couldn't, I thought I had it wrong. And, uh, and so I said, what do, you, what do you mean? What do you mean you understand? What do you understand? And I just, I couldn't understand. And what did she say? Well, she said, oh, I know. I've always known. You think I'm stupid? She was real um, snide. I, I think she was uh, either, I think she had been drinking and uh, was uh, real... Um, sarcastic? Yeah. Was that something that your mother was from time to time, sarcastic? Yes. So what did you say when she said she knew all along she wasn't stupid? I didn't know what to say. I just said, I hate you. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe what she was so saying. All you said was, I hate you? I said, I hate you. And what did you do? I ran out the back door. And what did your mother do? Uh, she immediately got up and started chasing me uh, outside. Was she saying anything? Uh, yeah. She was, she was saying, uh, get back here, you bastard. Uh, don't ever say that to me. How dare you say that to me? Now, what was she referring to? Did you know what, what to, to your saying, I hate you? Is that what she was referring to? Yeah, that's what she was you? angry at. She was angry at this point? Yeah, well, she was, I, I don't understand the mood she was in before I even got to the room. She was, uh, she was in a mood that she had been in a lot, um, but she was uh, angry at that point. Okay, when she said whatever she said to you sarcastically, she didn't seem angry then. No. But when you said, I hate you, then she got angry. Yes. Now, had you, had you heard your mother tell you or your brother, I hate you, I hate you, over the course of your life? Yeah. 
Had she said it once, twice? No, she said it often. So were you saying back to her what she had said to you? Objection sustained. So was this phrase, I hate you, was this something that you heard over the course of your life? Yes. Had you ever said it to your mother before? No. Did you hate your mother, Mr. Menendez? No, I didn't hate my mother. If you could speak up, it would help. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you hate your mother? No. Were you expecting her to say what she said to you in the den? No, not at all. And where did you go when you let when you ran out of the den? I ran to the guest house. And did your mother follow you? Yes, she chased after me. And did what she say did what strike that? Did what she had said affect you? Well, of course. Okay. You mean did it affect me? How do you mean? Emotionally. Yes. And were you upset? Yes. When you got to the guest house, did you call out to your brother? Uh, yes. And do you remember what it was, what the first thing was, that you said to him? I just said she knows, mom knows. And did there then ensue an argument between you and your mother and your brother? What happened next in the guest house? Mom came up the stairs uh, right after me and uh, she said, get back. She was still yelling at me. Okay, without getting into the, the words about it, okay, was there conversation in the guest house? Yes. And how would you characterize it? Was it friendly? Was it angry? Was it a discussion? Was it an argument? It was an angry argument between Lyle and Mom. And what were you doing while this argument was going on between Lyle and Mom? I was uh, standing behind Lyle, just sort of watching. Is that a position you had taken in the past in that family? Yes. Would you stand behind Lyle while he was fighting your battles? Yeah, I, I used to stand behind Lyle a lot. Uh, that's pretty much my fixed position. All right, the objection is sustained, the answer is stricken, and I would ask the witness also to speak up. Now, were there occasions other than this one when your brother was speaking on your behalf and you were standing behind him? Yes. Uh, pretty wait for a question, okay? Sorry. Do you remember when? When these other occasions yes. were? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us? <laughs> that happened all of my life. Starting at what age? from the time I can remember. Have you heard yourself described in this trial, Mr. Menendez, as a fearful, shy child? Yes. Were you? Yes. And did you think your brother was like you or dissimilar to you in that regard? He was braver than me. Um, I'm not sure why, but he was. And did you, when you were younger, say around the age of 13, 14, seek out his help when you were afraid? Yes. And was that help with respect to your parents? Yes. And did he help you? Yes. I mean, it depended on what was happening, but... Um, what do you mean by that? Whether he was able to help you depended on what was happening? Whether or not he'd interfere. Uh, he wouldn't interfere with me if, if it was Dad doing something to me or being violent to me or uh, yelling at me. He really wouldn't get involved. Sometimes he'd, he'd uh, try to help me if, if I'm just having an argument at the dinner table or something, but other than that, he didn't interfere too much. Well, was it, in your opinion, was it safe for him to interfere when your father was being violent or angry? I wouldn't have wanted to interfere. Well, my question was... No, it wasn't, it wasn't safe.
Now, what was uh, what was the subject matter of the <laughs> argument between your mother and your brother in the guest house Thursday night? Um, her knowing about Dad and I. Did she deny it? No. Did she acknowledge knowing? Yes. And did Lyle say anything about what she did or didn't do with respect to what she knew? Lyle asked her how she, how how could she not help me? How could she not intervene or, or or stop it? Something along those lines. And what did she say in response to that? She said that no one ever helped her, and, uh, and that why should she help me? That no one ever helped her in her life, and uh, and and went on. Okay, and. Was this something you had ever heard before from your mother, that no one ever helped her? Yes. Mr. Menendez, at this point, in August of 1989, did you feel um, that your mother had had a hard time in life? She had a miserable life. And how did you feel about her in regards to that? In regards to that, I felt sorry for her. And how long had you felt sorry for her? Since the time I can remember. And did you feel at all responsible for her having a miserable life? Yeah. Did she ever tell you you were responsible? Sometimes. And did you believe her? Yes. And how would she tell you that you were responsible? What did she say you had done? She would say that I, that I was born, but she would say that I was the, the problem in her life and that La and I had ruined her life and she wanted to do other things, but then she had children and it just destroyed what she wanted to do in her life. And how did that make you feel? Just real sad. So you felt sorry for her because of that? I felt sorry for her for that and a lot of other reasons. On this night, Thursday night, after you found out that she had known what had happened to you, when she was saying, no one ever helped me in my life, did you feel sorry for her then? No. Over the course of the preceding few months, did you have some perception that your mother had some kind of knowledge about you? Yes. And would you tell us what it was you were seeing or hearing or knowing? Just that she had this, this, this power, it seemed, this magic thing, that she always knew whatever I was doing or wherever I was going and pretty much everything about me that I didn't understand. Were you uh, prone to keep a, did you from time to time keep a diary? Yes. And where ordinarily did you keep your diary? In my bedroom. And were you having some problems that year with your diary? Uh, yeah, I kept losing them. You lost them? Uh, they just were disappearing on me. I didn't know what was happening. Were you taking them out of the house? No. Did you take them to school? No. Did you take them to tennis practice? No. But were you having trouble finding them? Yes. Did it ever occur to you that your mother might have been taking your diaries? No. Were there things that your mother seemed to know that were not in your diaries? Yes. What kinds of things? Just uh, where I was playing tennis or if a day I wasn't going to go to school to play tennis or this girl that I liked, where she lived, um, who she was even, and uh, just different things that I never told her about and she couldn't have known and she knew. She knew them? Yeah. She'd make remarks to you that told you that she knew them? Yes. Did you have any idea how it was that she knew these things that you weren't telling her? No, I had no idea. It was really strange to me. Did it make her seem strange to you? Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of things made her seem strange to me, but this, all that she knew was really weird. It was different. Now, over the course of several months before, uh, this Thursday night, had there also been discussion about your mother poisoning the family? 
Well, there hadn't been too much discussion about it, but that's what she had said. She said that? Yeah. Did your father ever tell you that she was likely to do that or might do that? Yes. And did that develop any sense of fear in you about your mother? Sort of. I, I, uh, I had a lot of fear about my mother. Well, well, let's talk first about the poisoning thing. Were you afraid of her because of that? Partly. Were you afraid of her because she seemed to have magical knowledge? Partly. And were there other reasons why you were afraid of her? Yes. And what did those have to do with? Just the fact that she would, she was real moody and real, she would change from one thing, from one mood to another. She would suddenly, she would be in a normal state and then she would just start yelling uh, and uh, throwing her arms around and throwing things and, and then she would switch back to her other mood. She, so, did you know what, I'm sorry, go ahead. She would disappear a lot. Um, I didn't know where she was going. Well, when, but uh, my question was, what, why did that make you afraid? Because she was unpredictable. <clears throat> Were you afraid of her being angry? Were you afraid of her hurting you? Were you afraid of her hurting herself? What was the nature of your fear before Thursday night? Basically those two, afraid of her hurting herself and uh, from all the suicide letters and her talking about how she didn't want to be and alive. What else? And her afraid of hurting me. Now, when you found out on Thursday that she knew what had been happening to you, how did that, if at all, influence the way you felt about or thought about your mother? Uh, I'm sorry. Did you not hear? No, I, I okay, didn't. Okay, we'll do it again. You learned on Thursday night for the first time that your mother knew what your father had been doing to you. Yes. And over the years, Mr. Menendez, from when you were six until you were 18, did your mother ever do anything to interfere with your father's sexual molestation of you? No. Did she ever come into a room when he was there doing it to you? No. Did she ever ask you why you were crying if you cried afterwards? No. Did she ever do anything to help? No. And over the course of all of those years, did you believe she was ignorant of it? Yes. Now, on this Thursday night, you find out she knew. Yes. How does that make you feel about her? You asking in the present tense or at the time? At the time, Your Honor. At the time. Uh, it made me real confused. It made me really angry. Um, it made me feel like she knew all the time and she never helped me and that she betrayed me. It made me, uh, I, I can't describe how it made me feel. Did it make you wonder if you knew her? No, I thought I didn't know her. Objection overruled. Had you always thought you didn't know her, or was this the thought that night? That was the thought that night. That you didn't know who she was? I, I didn't know who she was. And was that at all frightening? That was, that was very scary. Um, just the fact that she knew and she never did anything was scary. Now, at some point, did the argument between your mother and your brother end? Yes. And did she leave the guest house? Yes. And then did you have a discussion with your brother? Yes. And do you recall the first thing that came up in the discussion with your brother? Yes. What was that? I asked him what in the world was going on. What, 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 what is happening? Why, why all this was happening? Okay. Did you, were you trying to find out something? Yeah, I asked him how his talk with Dad went and, and why Dad was so angry. I told him that Dad was angry. And okay, well, s slow down for a second, okay? <coughs> you asked him why was this happening? Yes. Did you also tell him anything about what had happened to you? Not, not yet. Okay. So first you want to know what the conversation was like? Yes. And do you at some point tell him that your father was angry 
and had demonstrated his anger against you in the bedroom? Yes, he wanted to know before anything. He wanted to know what had just happened. So that's what I'm trying to figure out, okay? What was the first part of the conversation? Was it Lyle trying to find out why are you and mom running to the guest house, or was it you trying to find out what happened with dad? Well, it was me trying to find out what happened with dad, and Lyle saying, no, first tell me about what happened with what happened with me. Okay, so did you tell him what had happened with you? Yes. And did you tell him about your conversation with your mother? Yes. Okay, and then where did your conversation with your brother go? He told me about his conversation. He told me about what happened with Dad. And what of significance did he tell you about his conversation with Dad? He told me that things uh, didn't go well in the conversation and that uh, he had basically threatened him. And how did you react to hearing that Lyle had threatened your father? I couldn't believe it. I was uh, not happy. I started yelling. I started saying, are you threatened Dad? Are you crazy? And uh, why, why couldn't you believe it? Well, I, I mean, I could believe it, but I thought it was the stupidest thing in the world that you could possibly do to this to threaten Dad. And uh, had I, there been any discussions before Thursday night about what Lyle should or should not do in the conversation with your father? Vaguely. Did you think before Thursday night that Lyle would? threaten your father? No. I didn't know exactly what he was going to do, but I figured that if he was so optimistic, he had a reason to be optimistic, and he wasn't going to go in and say what he said. Now, what was the nature of the threat as you understand it from what Lyle told you? Just that if Dad ever touched me again, that Lyle would tell everyone. And did that? why did it concern you that he had said that? Because you don't go and, and threaten Dad, and especially what Dad had just done to me. I, I couldn't believe it. I. All right, well, how did you think your father would react to a threat to expose him publicly as a child molester? He would not react well. What does that mean? She would kill you. He would not permit you to do that. Was your father a person concerned with his public image? Yes. What about your mother? Yes. And how do you know that? Because they had talked about it, and they had talked about it with me since I was in Muncie. From the time you were a child, were there things that you were told to hide or conceal or lie about to strangers to make your family look good? Yes. Was that routine? Yes. Were you even told to lie and hide things from the rest of the family to make your immediate family look good? Objection. Sustained. Do you recall your mother ever talking to you about what to do with your school books or your homework when you went to see your Aunt Terry? Yeah, when I went to my Aunt Terry, she told me specifically not to mention my grades, and if I did, to tell her that I was just getting A's, and to hide my books in a corner somewhere where I knew where I could get them, and I knew if they were touched. Okay, and did you understand why it was your mother was telling you to do this with your Aunt Terry? Yes. Why? I thought that she just didn't feel that I was getting good enough grades and didn't want anyone to know the grades I was getting. Now, had you also heard in your family, from your mother and your father, statements about how your family compared to other families? Yes. And what was it that they would say about your family? Well, they said our family... Overall. They said our family was this great thing and this, this with a lot of ancestry and that it was going to be a, a huge family and successful and they didn't want anything to diminish that. Better than other people, was that the message? Yes. Is there any doubt in your mind that your father felt superior to everybody else? No, he definitely did. And were there things that your mother said and did that made you think she also felt that she was superior to other people? I knew that she felt that way. I don't know that there's things that she said. I assume I don't remember at the moment. Sustained. The answer is stricken. Okay. You knew that she felt that way. How did you know she felt that way? The way she felt about being superior? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I can't remember right now. Okay. Well, this example that you gave us of what you were supposed to do with your Aunt Terry, okay? Mm -hmm. Did that tell you anything about your mother wanting people to think you were superior? Well, I certainly knew that she didn't want anyone to know the flaws or the bad things in the family. And she wanted the family to see purpose. Um, that was very clear. All right, so we're back to Thursday night, and you're having this conversation um, with your brother. And do you tell him, do you share with him your opinion of what this threat to your father now means? What's going to happen? Oh, I thought we were going to die. And I was, I, I told him that after I had gotten, just gotten to the guest house. I told him that Dad's going to kill us because of what Dad said to me. And no. I was just... Go ahead. I was just sitting on the couch with my hands in my head saying, we're going to die. We're going to die. I can't believe this. I can't believe you did this. Now, kids often say, I mean, you're familiar with kids saying, oh, my father's going to kill me. Oh, my parents are going to kill me. Is that what you're talking about? No. No. I, I, Dad was going to kill us. I thought for sure that Dad was going to... I couldn't believe what Lyle had done and how it was just all messed up. Everything was gone. There wasn't me going to Princeton or him coming to UCLA. It was Dad... But what did he tell you that your father had said? Now, he told you, Lyle told you that he had threatened your father. Mm -hmm. What did he tell you about, Lyle, about your father's response to the threat? My dad said that he was going to tell everyone anyway. I don't understand. Dad thought that Lyle was going to tell everyone anyway, whether he touched me or not again. That's what Lyle said. And what else did Dad tell him? Do you remember? Um... He told him that, uh, I, I, I don't remember the details. Do you remember your brother testifying that your father said that you had made your choice and he had made his? Yes. Remember that testimony? Yes. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, he, Lyle told me all about the conversation. Um, I don't remember exactly what he told me that night versus what he testified here, but I heard all of that in the conversation. So where did your conversation with your brother go after he had told you um, what had happened in the conversation with your father? What happened then? Well, I was, I was really panicking. I was crying and getting hysterical, and uh, Lyle was trying to calm me down. But I would look at him, and he looked afraid, and that just got me worse, because if Lyle was afraid, I was really afraid. And, uh, and so he was just saying, it's going to be okay, we'll, we'll think, don't worry about it, and uh, trying to calm me down. Okay, and did you then have a conversation, as he has previously testified, about what could you do now? Yes. Okay. And what were the different things that you considered? <clears throat> he said, we got to get out of here. We've we got we to gotta leave the house and just get away. So one of the things was to just leave the house that night. Yes. And did you agree or disagree with him? Oh, I said, you're crazy. We can't go anywhere. Where are we going to go? And well, what was your concern, if any, if you had left the house that night? My concern? You just learned that your brother had basically threatened to tell on your father. Yes. If the two of you disappeared that night, did you have in mind anything that your father might think about that? Well, I thought Dad was going to kill us, and no matter where we went, anywhere, he was going to kill us. I th he, he, obviously, my dad thought that Lyle and I were going to go tell somebody. So if you left the house that night, what do you think your dad would have thought? That he, we, we were going to tell. That you had gone to tell. I don't know if we had gone to tell that instant, but that we were definitely going to tell. Now, in addition to talking about leaving the house that night, was there any discussion about running away permanently. Yes, that's what he was talking about. Okay. Well, you recall your brother testified that there were really two separate discussions. One about let's get out of here right now. Well, and the other was what can we do to avoid this threat in the future? Lyle was really concerned that they were going to come kill us right then. And we locked the door and we checked the outside to see if anyone was coming. And and then he said, we got to leave. we got to get out of this house. And I said, well, you know, where are we going to go? He says, we got to get away. OK. 
tip. Now, in in your mind, you think he's talking about running away like him permanently? Yes. And did you agree with him? Good, let's go do that. No, there was no chance of that. Now, why do you think, or why did you think then <coughs> there was no chance of that? Because of things that my dad had told me and who my dad was. And there was, there was no place in this world that, that my dad my dad was going to find us with this information that I had. And he knew that I wasn't the most stable person and that I could just tell um, if, if I knew he was chasing me. And I. What do you mean you weren't the most stable person? In the context of this family, okay, what was wrong with you? Why do you think your dad didn't think you were stable? My dad didn't think much of me. Um, he didn't think I was very bright. He didn't think that I. He thought I was too sensitive. He didn't think I was strong enough. He thought that I gave in too easily. And gave in too easily to what? In arguments, in, in fights. Um, Were uh, you too emotional? Yeah. Were you not in control of feelings? Yeah, that's what he thought. I remember he said that there was, a, there was a gang fight once where a group of kids came over to our high school and I was on the tennis court and I got beat up and he he really was angry at me for that. He just he just thought that I was wasn't who he wanted Lyle to be, and so um, I was thinking that if I ran away, he would he would find me. He would come after me for that reason. In your family, based on what you heard your father say over the years, was it a positive trait? To be sensitive, to be emotional, to express feelings, to feel pain. Was that a positive thing or a negative thing? Uh, it was extremely negative. Was it a sign of weakness or strength to be in touch with emotions? Weakness. Matter? Now, your mother, was she an emotional person? Very emotional. And did she seem to have feelings and express at least her own pain? She expressed it a lot. And did your father ridicule her for that? He ridiculed her to her and to us. He talked about her behind her back to you? Yes. And did you get the clear idea that both you and your mother were in the emotional not to be trusted column? Yeah, I worked hard at, at not being emotional. I worked hard at trying to not cry and, and to, to hold back my feelings. And I, I tried, and I did well at times, but um, not enough. You've heard a whole bunch of witnesses come in here and talk about you crying all the time, right? Yeah. You think you were very successful with uh No, I, I wasn't uh, successful enough. Let me show you something, in fact, if I could. All right, it's Mark 266. <clears throat> Mr. Menendez, I'm showing you this document. Um, and just so you see, know what you're looking at, this is not an original document. This is a photocopy of a postcard. Yes. Understand that? And if you would just read it to yourself. OK. And who is it written to? To me. And who is it from? Um, Daddy. Daddy? That's what it says, Dad. And who is Daddy? Dad. Your father? Yes. And would you just, uh, first of all, does he spell your name right? No, he misspells it. Now, would you read out loud just the first sentence? Um, dear Eric, I trust that you are not crying much. And do you know how old you were when your father wrote this postcard to you, trusting that you weren't crying as much? I think I was in Muncie. I, I don't know. Muncie? Probably. How, how old were you when you moved from Muncie? I'm not sure uh, when he wrote me this. Okay. Uh, I was six or six and a half, seven. Now, when you would cry in front of your father, how would he deal with it? He'd either hit me or um, put me in my room. Would he ridicule you for it? Yes. 
Would he tell you not to do it like he's telling you in that postcard? He'd, he'd call me names. He'd call me a sissy and uh, a crybaby and uh, he'd just ban me to my room. Now, returning to that Thursday night, you and your brother discussed the possibility of running away. Yes. And you didn't think you could do that? No, I did not think I could. What other possibilities did you discuss? Going to the police, going to the relatives, um, just anything we could think of. And now your brothers described this conversation already about why you didn't feel the police uh, would be a viable option. Do you agree with what he said? That oh, I'm the one that told him we could not go to the police. Okay. And why did you tell him, what was it you were telling him about why you couldn't go to the police? That the police weren't going to be able to protect us from dad. That there was no chance that the police were going to be able to do anything. And we... we, we let, let me ask you something. Had you, over the course of your life, seen anybody stand up successfully to your father? No. Had you seen anybody ever try? Yes. Who was that? Uh, a uh, car salesman at a BMD, BMW dealership. Okay, and what was the outcome of that attempt? The uh, car salesman uh, started to cry. Grown man? Yeah. Did you ever see your father afraid of anybody? No. Did your father talk about being afraid of anybody? No. No, he, he did the opposite. <clears throat> he did what? He did the opposite. He used to come home and tell stories about how he wasn't afraid or was fearless in this or did this when most people would be afraid. Did he ever tell you stories about how people were afraid of him? Yes. So you didn't feel the police could protect you from your father? No. And concerning the relatives, Mr. Menendez, was there any adult relative in your family that you were close to before your parents died? No. Are you closer to those people now than then? Yes. In fact, can you remember ever having any real conversations with, for example, your godmother, your Aunt Martha, before your parents died? No. Now, she lived in New Jersey at some point and then in Florida, is that right? Yeah. For the two years or so before your parents died, did she live in Florida? Yes. When you were young, between the ages, say, of 11 and 15, and living in New Jersey, did you think about what your father was doing to you on a regular basis, even when it wasn't happening? Yes. Did you think um, about it when you were around your relatives? Yes. Did you ever think that they knew? Yes. No. Do you now think that they knew? No, they didn't know, but I was paranoid about it at the time. What do you mean you're paranoid about it? They would give me a look, or they would smile at me in a certain way, or say something, and I would just look at them and say, God, they, they know, they know. So did you think when you were little that they were a, anybody that you could have turned to? Overall. No, uh, not just because of that, though. Okay. But let's fast forward now back to Thursday night. At that time, did you think that you could go to your relatives and tell them that your father was a child molester and have them protect you? Definitely not. Why? Because you just didn't, you just didn't stand up to my dad. My, my relatives certainly weren't going to stand up to my dad like that and, and hide us out or keep us. They admired my dad. My dad was the was the big figure in the family. He was the successful, admired one. And uh, he was also the uh, feared one. And uh, you, you didn't disobey him, really. So you didn't think any of them would stand up to him? No, they wouldn't have. 
You didn't think anybody would oppose, any of them would oppose him? No. And did you ever hear your other relatives actually bragging about your father? Were they proud of his accomplishments? Everyone was proud of his accomplishments. Now, you thought your grandmother loved you, didn't you? My grandmother? Yeah. Yes. And, and how did you feel about her? I loved her. And how did she feel about your father? She loved my dad. More than anybody else? More than anyone in the world. And did you have any particular desire to tell your grandmother what had been going on? No. So where did the conversation with your brother Lyle lead to Thursday night? Uh, it led to us having to buy guns. It led to Lyle um, saying, we got to protect ourselves. We got to do something. <laughs> because I kept eliminating all of his options. Okay, he was coming up with options. Yeah, I was, I was pretty much just crying and, and doing whatever I was doing. And he was saying, well, well, what if we could do this? Well, what if we do that? And he said, calm down, we'll work it out. And I was just not being very helpful. Did you think any of the options would work? No. So a decision was made to try to protect yourselves yourself. Is yes. that it? And on that night, on Thursday night, when you were talking to your brother about what might happen, you were talking about the fact that dad would kill you. Is that right? Yes. Did you think your mother would stop him? Oh, I thought my mom would do it with him. There wasn't no one and the other. Why did you think your mother would do it with him? Because that's who my mom was. She was, they were a very much of a team. Um, besides the fact that my mom hated us, um, they were uh, a team. Were you so sure that your mother hated you before Thursday night as you were after? After, I definitely knew. Uh, I mean, for her to have known all of those years, I knew she must have hated me, but I was, I thought it before as well. Now, what did you do after you and, and uh, Lyle decided that you would try to protect yourselves and, and buy guns? Where did you remain or where did you stay that Thursday night? I stayed in the, um, the front section of the guest house. The front section of the guest house. Are there two rooms upstairs in the guest house? Yes. W what is the front section? Uh, there's, it's like a little couch and a uh, two chair, two two chairs, like a little living room. A living room. Mm -hmm. You stayed there and Lyle stayed in the in the bedroom. Yes. Uh, how much sleep do you think you got that night? Not much. Now, do you recall whether or not that night you had a familiar nightmare? Yes. And had you been having nightmares? for some period of time up till then in your life? Yes. How long? Since I was, since I was in Pennington. Since I lived in Pennington. Back up from the mic a little since bit. Since I lived in Pennington. Since you first moved to Pennington? I don't know how much they were happening in Muncie, but I was, I, I think and they started in Pennington. Okay, my qu you lived somewhere else between Muncie and Pennington. Do you remember that? Yeah, I don't remember that house too well. Okay, in 1978, we've heard here, is when you moved to Pennington in the fall of 1978, okay? Okay. All right. So do you think you were having nightmares from the very beginning, or they started up sometime after you moved there, or what? I think they started up sometime after I moved. Your Honor, if we're going to take a break, this would be a convenient time. All right, we'll take a recess and resume at 20 minutes after the hour. Please don't discuss this case with anyone or form any final opinions about it, and we'll resume at 3.20. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Menendez, I want to back up for a moment. You recall you were telling us before how your mother seemed to know things that, uh, that you couldn't find a logical or rational reason for her to know. Remember that? Yes. Uh, after your parents died, did you find something in your parents' bedroom that made you understand how it was that she knew everything. Yes. 
And is there a photograph in front of you on the witness stand right now that shows you where it was in your parents' bedroom that you found this thing? Yes. And can you describe for the jury, the juries, where it was? Uh, under my mother's nightstand. And what was it you found? A uh, tape recording with a phone jack in it. Your Honor, I have an envelope marked uh, 267. It's been shown to Mr. Korean. An envelope and contents. <coughs> Menendez, would you uh, circle the entire nightstand so that now where in relation to the nightstand was this tape recorder and phone jack? Was right in, right underneath. On the left side, the right side? The ref the right side if you're facing the nightstand. Okay. And show me what's contained uh, in the envelope, Mark 267. Do you know what that is? Yes, this was the telephone uh, hook uh, device to the um, recorder. Okay, and does that particular uh, device have a telephone jack attachment? Yes. You've just pulled that out? Yes. And where did the other parts go, do you remember? Uh, one, one, I guess they both... This one went into the recorder, I think. I'm not quite sure exactly what this went into. Okay. Now you also told us, did you find tape recordings after your parents died that uh, told you what that recorder was used for? Uh, yes, I did. And uh, whose voices were on the tape recordings that you found? Mine. And who else? Whoever I was talking to. They were just tape recordings of my phone conversations. They were tape recordings of phone calls to your number? Anytime the phone was picked up, apparently, the tape recording went on because I could hear the buttons being pushed on the tape recorder. All right. But if you listen to the question, were they tape recordings of incoming calls to you and outgoing calls from you both? Yes. And could you tell by listening to some of the tapes how far back these recordings went? I heard one that went back to, to the winter, but there were so many tapes I didn't look at them all. Went back to the winter of 88, 89? Yes. And did you uh, ever uh, play or show any portion of those tapes to any friends of yours? Yes. And do you remember who you might have played any portions of them for. I know I played a portion to Danny Roberts. Was he a friend of yours from Beverly Hills High School? Yes. Did you keep those tape recordings of your phone calls? No, I threw them all away. When you found them, did it explain what you thought was magical towers on the part of the room? Yes. Now, returning for a moment to Thursday night, in addition to what you have uh, told us about what your brother Lyle related to you concerning his conversation with your father, okay, did Lyle also tell you that your father had basically said that he was going to go on doing whatever he was doing with you? Yes. And did Lyle express some kind of reaction that he had had or that he was feeling to your father saying, basically, I'm going to molest whoever I want to molest. Yes. And, and what was... Did he tell you that your father said that, you know, he just, that you were his son and he'd do whatever he wanted? Whatever he wanted with me. Um, yes, Lyle said he threatened him at that point. I don't know if he Lyle used... Lyle said who threatened at that point? Lyle threatened dad. Okay. All right. Now, what was Lyle expressing to you on Thursday night about how he reacted to your father's basically saying he would continue. How he reacted in the room with my father or in the room with me? With you. About the room with my dad? All right, let's start over. Let's start over. In the room with me, he, he, he looked scared. Uh, he was telling me that he got angry with my dad when he was talking to my dad, though. 
Did he tell you anything about how shocking or un unexpected your father's response was? Did he tell you why he had threatened to expose your father? Yeah, because he was surprised by dad's reaction. He couldn't believe how dad was reacting to what he was saying. Did Lyle indicate to you whether or not he planned to threaten your father with exposure or just lost control of the conversation? No, he, he didn't plan, uh, at least to my knowledge, to threaten dad. Well, did he tell you basically he blew it? He lost yeah. it? No, because I remember in the conversation on Wednesday, I was telling him, you know, Lyle thought he had, he had control of the situation. I was trying to tell him, Dad's not going to be so happy, and, you know, don't be careful. And Lyle was telling me on Thursday that he blew it, basically. What that he saying? blew it? Yeah. Because he threatened to expose him? Yeah. Now, I was asking you just before the break about um, a nightmare. Was there a particular nightmare that you had many, many times in your life? Yes. Did you have it many times before August of 1989? Yes. Have you even had it many times since? Yes. Did you have it the night of uh, Thursday, August 17th, 1989? Yes. Could you tell us briefly what that nightmare was? It was about uh, a, uh, a green face and how it changed in, into becoming dad uh, chasing me through this darkness. And was this dream about a green face that chases you? This is, you had had that before? Yes. Was there also any animal-like figures in this dream? Yeah, there were uh, a cow and a horse. And where would the cow and the horse and the green face how did the dream begin? Well, the dream began with me just becoming real tiny and everything just got larger and larger and I felt like I was disappearing and, uh, and it was real, it was, it was terrifying. And, and then it, that disappeared and I went, in, I went into a different, a different uh, state. I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Is this Suddenly, how the dream always was? Yes. It always started with you shrinking? Yes. And then when did green face and cow and horse show up in the dream? Right, right. Well, the, the, the cow and the horse were not always in that dream. They were sometimes in different dreams. Um, they were things that I was afraid of along with the green face. Um, it was pretty much the green face that would chase me most. Sometimes the cow and the horse would be there. The dream uh, was, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. All right, well, what would happen with the green face? You'd start to be chased by this green-faced creature. Mm -hmm. And when would it turn into dead? Almost immediately. And did you see other people in this dream that you knew? Yes. Who would you see in the dream? Uh, Alicia, Sylvia, Anna Maria. Who are they? My relatives. But my what cousins. about your aunts and uncles? Would you see them too? No. What about your mother? Was she ever in that dream? Yes. Now, would these other people, your relatives and your mother, show up during the part of the dream when you're being chased? Yes, but at different points. Okay. How, d did you run to people in this dream? I ran to my relatives and asked them if they, they, I told them that dad was chasing me and asked them if they saw dad and they would say no. And I would run, I ran to Lyle and, uh, and then he would suddenly abandon me and run away. What about mom? What, what? I would run to mom, but she was over this, this, the roof of the Pennington house. In the dream, she was over the roof? Yeah, she was sort of floating in the sky in the Pennington house. So you couldn't get to her either? No, I tried. And how would this dream end? With me falling off the roof in the Pennington house. And is that the version of the dream that you had Thursday night? Yes. Now, on Friday, did you hear your brother testify that you went with him uh, to a gun store, a Big Five in Santa Monica, and yeah. inquired about buying handguns? Yes. And we're told that you, there was a two-week waiting period? Yes. Is that true? Yes. Did you do that? Yes. Before you left the house to go to that gun store, had you been on the tennis court practicing? Yes. And did your brother have a conversation with you to get you to stop practicing and do something else? 
Yes. Now, did you hear your brother testify that he said something like, just because it's a new day doesn't mean things are okay? That's basically what he said. Okay. What were you saying to him that made you say that? That made, I'm sorry, what were you saying to Lyle that made him say that to you? Well, he came over to the tennis court and asked if, if I was ready to go. And I said, no. I said something like, I'm playing tennis, I got a tournament coming up, I don't really feel like it. And he said something like, you know, I, I realize this is, this is uh, you know, hard to think about, but this is real. This isn't something that's, that's, that's going to go away. This is serious. And uh, I just didn't want to deal with it. Well, what were you thinking that? Was it a sunny, right, sunny Friday morning? Yes. And what were you thinking that morning about whether it was real? I thought it was real, but it seemed like a, it seemed like a bad dream the night before. The, the next morning, the sun was out, the birds were chipping, and, and it just seemed like this wasn't happening, and I didn't want to think about it. Okay. So after your brother told you that things were serious, did you have to think about it? Yes. And did you agree with him? Yeah, I agreed to go. Did you think that what had happened on Thursday, his talk with your father, your confrontation with your father, your mother telling you what she told you. Did you think that was serious stuff? Oh, I knew it was serious stuff. That's why I didn't want to think about it. Had you spent time in earlier years think when your father was threatened to do something to you if you told, okay, had you thought about what it was he would do? If I told? Mm-hmm. Well, he told me what he would do if I told. He told you what? He told me that he'd kill me. He told me that he'd tie me a chair and, and beat me to death. He told me all sorts of things. Did you ever picture what would happen if it came out inside the family? In other words, if you told Lyle and if your parents found out you had told Lyle, had you ever envisioned this happening? No. Now, after you went to the Big Five in Santa Monica, did you drive towards uh, in the direction of San Diego with your brother? Uh, soon after. But you did take that drive? Yes. And when you started that drive, had there been any decision by yourself and your brother to go ahead and buy a long gun since you couldn't buy a handgun? No. And was there a discussion in the car after which such a decision was made? There was a discussion before the decision was made, yes. Yes, and, and after that discussion, was it then that you decided you had to get a gun, even if it had to be a long gun? Yes. And what was the subject matter of that discussion in the car? Um, the things that Dad had done to me. The sexual things and other things? Yes. And was this the first time that you were actually telling your brother what had happened? Uh, yeah, the details of what had happened. Did you tell him all the details of everything that happened for 12 years? No, definitely not. Basically, what did you tell him about the sex itself? Do you recall? It's not offered for the truth, Your Honor. Well, at this point, there is no request for the substance of it, just whether he recalls. So the objection is overruled to the form of the question. What's the question again? All right. Do you rem this is just a preparatory question. Do you remember what you told your brother about what the nature of the sexual activity between yourself and your father had been? Yes. Okay. What did you tell him the nature of the sexual activity had been? Objection, Houston. Objection sustained as to the formal question is calling for hearsay. It's not being offered for the truth, Your Honor, but to explain Lyle Menendez's state of mind and why he formed the opinion that his father was sick, which he testified to. All right. The objection is overruled. It will be received only uh, as it might reflect upon the state of mind of the person hearing the statement and as to what, if any, state of mind he had in reaction to it. All right. Do you understand the question? Yes. Okay. Can you answer the question? I told him that it was, that it was basically oral sex that was happening. Okay. And did you tell him anything about any kind of violence that would accompany it or any kind of threats from your father? Yes. And what did you tell him about violence? I told him that there were um, pins and tacks 
that dad would uh, um, that dad would stick in me and use. Pins Could you speak up, please? That dad would stick in me and use. Pins and tacks? Yes. And did you give him the impression that these pins and tacks were being used during oral sex? Yes. And in fact, was that something that did happen between yourself and your father when you were a teen? Yes. And what, if anything, did you tell him about any weapons that your father ever threatened you with? I told him that he threatened me with a knife. Now, Mr. Menendez, do you remember the kind of knife that your father threatened you with? Yes. What kind was it? It was a jagged knife. A what? A jagged knife on one end. It was a, it was a Rambo knife. A Rambo knife? Yeah, a knife that he had. Your father's company, did you, did you understand that your father's company was partly owned by the company that made the Rambo movies? Yes. And was there a promotional item, a knife, like the knife Rambo uses in the movie? Yes. That your father received? Yes. And was that knife kept in the Beverly Hills and Calabasas houses? Yes. And is that what he used to threaten you? Yes. And was that the knife you were referring to earlier when you said there was one occasion when you said no? And Objection sustained. Was there an occasion when you said no? Yes. Was there a knife used on that occasion? Yes. What knife was that? The Rambo knife. When you were telling your brother about a knife, was it that occasion you were talking about or some other occasion? That occasion. Overall. What was your answer? That occasion. And did you tell your brother um, the specific kinds of threats that your father had made, should you tell? Yes. Had your father ever threatened to hurt anyone besides you if you told someone? Yes. And what was that threat? He told me that he would kill whoever I told. He would kill whoever you told? Yes. Now, Mr. Menendez, on that Friday, August 18th, 1989, you were, car were you carrying Don Donovan Goudreau's driver's license with you? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. How long had you carried it up to that point? Uh, a few months. Were you in New Jersey when your Aunt Terry uh, was cleaning out Lyle's college room? Yes. Were you aware that she found Donovan's license? Yes. Did you receive his license in New Jersey or back in California? In, in New Jersey. And what purpose, if any, did you use that license before August 18th, 1989? To get into a nightclub here and there. Did you have another ID that was fake? Yes. And was that, what name was that ID in? Richard Stevens. And did you know a Richard Stevens? No, it was a fake, uh, fake ID. Well, was there such a person once upon a time, do you think? Possibly, not that I knew. How did you get a license in the name of Richard Stevens? Oh, they had birth certificates at the uh, high school in Calabasas. Many kids had them. They had birth certificates? Birth certificates that you would take to the DMV and just say, you're this person, and they give you an ID. Were these real birth certificates, fake birth certificates? You didn't know. I think they were fake. But you used such a fake birth certificate to get a license in the name of Richard Stevens? Yes. With whose picture on it? My picture. <clears throat> and what address? I don't remember. A fake address? I think so. I'm not sure. And what date of birth? Uh, over 21. I don't remember the date of birth. Would it be based on the fake birth certificate, what the date of birth was? Yes. And did you carry that one around with you all the time? No. Why not? Because I didn't want to lose it. I mean, Why? I had lost my wallet before, and I had lost uh, my cousin of mine's ID that I had used then, so I was without one. And uh, when I got the Stevens one, I just kept it in my bedroom for safekeeping. Did you ever take it out of your bedroom? Yeah, when I knew I was going to go to a nightclub or I knew I was going to need it, then I'd uh, take it. Did you consider that a better fake ID than Donovan's? Well, that one was real. Well, how could it be real? 
Well, it had my signature and it had my picture, so it was, it was, so and it was a real DMV uh, license. So I mean, I was, it was real. Well, Donovan's was real too. It was just real for him. It was real for him, but you know, I looked like Donovan, but I wasn't Donovan, and I wasn't six one or whatever his height was. So you didn't really match the description or entirely match the appearance on Donovan's license? Is that what you're saying? No, not as well as my own description. Okay, and the Richard Stevens license had your description, your picture? Yes. Did your mother know that you were getting this Richard Stevens license? Yes, she told me how to do it. She told you how to do it? How to go to the DMV and get it made. So did she know you had this fake birth certificate and were intending to do this? Yes. Now, what about a real Eric Menendez driver's license? Was there such a thing in existence? Uh, once upon a time. I mean, were you licensed by the state of California? Yes. And it wasn't suspended or revoked at that time, was it? Uh, no. But where was your license? I had lost it with my wallet. And in fact, in July, In July of 1989, did you receive a traffic ticket uh, citing you for, among other things, uh, having no license in your possession? Yes. Now, do you remember if on July 7th, 1989, when you got that ticket, uh, were you carrying either the Richard Stevens ID or the Donovan Control <coughs> ID? I was carrying Donovan's. And uh, why didn't you show that to the policeman who stopped you? because it wasn't my license. So you didn't want to show him a completely false license for this ticket? No. Let me have a moment, John. Yes. Mr. Menendez, showing you the last entry on this computer driving record, do you see a ticket that you received on July 7th, 1989? Yes. And do you see there are three violations there? Yes. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Kuriyama, are the people willing to stipulate that one of those violations, section 12951A of the California Vehicle Code, is for having no license in one's possession? So stipulated. Thank you. Mr. Menendez, you recall when you were in San Diego that you went to two different places down there that sold guns? Yes. Can I get you to stop reading that? Thank yes. You. Thank you. And did you uh, learn after going to the first place that you'd need something in order to purchase even shotguns? Yes. What would you need? Uh, driver's license. And you had Donovan's with you? Yes. Had you ever signed Donovan's name? Had you ever used the license in a way that required you to sign his name? No. Did you know whether or not you would have to do that when you bought guns? No, I wasn't sure. Did you think you might? I thought I might. Did you think you might need uh, some address other than the address on Donovan's license to buy guns in San Diego? I thought I might. And what was the general area? First of all, did you notice Donovan's address on the license? Sure. Was it the San Diego or Los Angeles area? No. What did you do, if anything, in order to come up with a local address? I looked in a telephone book. And where were you when you looked in the telephone book? I had a restaurant, and I think it was Bob's Big Boy. I'm not sure. A semi-fast food restaurant? Yeah, like a Denny's type of thing. And was this in the San Diego area? Yes. Was this before or after you went to the first gun store down there? This was after. And you looked in the book to find an address? Yes. And later on, when you were inside the Big Five, did you remember that address that you had looked at in the book? No. 
So what did you do to give the saleswoman an address when you were in the Big Five? I just signed August. Why? Because it was the month of August. I, didn't, I couldn't think of anything else to do. You had forgotten what you had seen? I'd forgotten the address that I was supposed to use, so I just used August. And what about for the number? Where'd you get the number from? I just made it up. Now, did you give the saleswoman uh, the information that Donovan Gudra was born in Burlingame, California? Yes. Do you recall Mr. Gudra testifying here that he was born in Glenora, California? No, but... You don't remember that? No. Now, had you been to Burlingame, California that summer? Yeah, that's where I played tennis. Was that that's in July? Yes. And did you believe that Mr. Goudreau was born in Northern California? Yes. And was Burlingame in Northern California? Yes. Is that why you used it? Yes. Now, when you were at the restaurant, at some point, did you try to write Mr. Goudreau's signature? Yes. Did you practice? Yes. How many times? Sustain. Council, ask your next question. Did you eat at the restaurant? Yes. And you told us you looked in the phone book? Yes. What else did you do? I practiced the signature. How many times did you practice the signature? I mean, how many times did you write it? Like four or five times. Did you do anything else while you were at the restaurant? Did you use the restrooms? Did you go outside to make a phone? Did you do anything? I ate. I don't really remember what else I did. What about your brother? Do you remember what, if anything, he did at the restaurant? I don't remember. Was he with you all the time, or did he leave you at some point? No, he left me uh, a lot. Do you know what he was doing? I don't quite know. <coughs> well, do you know if he went to the restroom? Mm. I guess. I guess that's where he was going. How long did it take the two of you to drive down to San Diego from Santa Monica? Two, two and a half, three hours. And then you went to a gun store? Yes. And then you went to this restaurant? Yes. And then you ate? Yes. Do you believe your brother ate? Yes. Did you have anything to drink? Yes. Now you returned to Los Angeles Friday night. Yes. Right? And you recall a conversation with your mother Friday night concerning the boat trip? Yes. And do you remember your brother testifying to that conversation? Yes. And was that essentially the way you also remembered it? Yes. Then let's move on to Saturday then. Do you recall on Saturday in the afternoon going to a gun store here in Van Nuys? Yes. How was that gun saw strike that? Who selected that gun store? I did. And how did you know about it? I looked it up in the phone book. Was there a particular reason why you selected that particular gun store? Yes. And what was the reason? Because it had a firing range next to it. And how did you know that? Because it said so in the phone book. I think there was a little picture. I'm not quite sure. Said so in the phone book that it had a firing range? Yes. And why did you care if the gun store had a firing range? Because I had no idea how to fire this gun. And if I ever had to, I thought I might need to know how. On Friday, when you were coming back to Los Angeles, had you put any shells in your gun? Yes. How many had you put in? Two. And were these the shells that your brother picked up off the stack in the Big Five? Yes. And why did you put two shells in in the car? So that I could see if I could load it and so that it would be loaded. Why didn't you load it all the way? I didn't think I'd need to. Did you know what two shells could or would do to someone? I had an idea. 
Did you think that was a big, uh, a very dangerous thing, two shotgun shells and a shotgun? Yes. When you uh, got to the gun store on Saturday, the one in Van Nuys, did you find something out about the firing range? Yes. What did you find out? That you couldn't fire off a, uh, I guess, a shotgun or a rifle inside in uh, the range. Was it, what kind of firing range did it, was it? It was an indoor firing range, and you could only fire off, apparently, handguns or something like that. But you were told by the people at the establishment that you could not fire a shotgun in, at that range. Yeah, I was told by the people across the street, I guess. Across the street? At, at the gun store. The firing range was across the street from the, from the little gun store. Okay. Did you make your inquiries at the gun store or at the firing range? At the gun store. And the people at the gun store told you you couldn't use the range for a shot? That's right. Had you even taken the shot, had you taken the shotgun along with you? Yes. Had you taken it out of the car? No. While you were at the gun store, uh, did you and your brother purchase different ammunition from what he had picked up from the stack at the Big Five? Yeah, we purchased what the guy said to purchase. And do you recall what type of ammunition it was? I know now it was Buck. Well, what was he telling you it was? The guy at the store? He was telling me it was Buck, too. I, I don't. Buck shot? Yes. And did the guy at the store give you any explanation of what the purpose of the ammunition that you had already bought the day before was? Yes. And what did he tell you it was? It was birdshot for shooting uh, uh, birds. And did he tell you how that stuff worked? Yeah, he said it spread real fast. It didn't work well for burglars. That's what he said. And you had led him to believe that you were seeking ammunition for home protection? Sustain. Why do you think he mentioned burglars? Because we had told him that uh, we just needed protection uh, around the house. And uh, so he gave us the stuff that he thought we should use. It's not offered for the truth, Your Honor. All right, it will be received only to reflect the state of mind of the witness and for no other reason. Now, did you, after purchasing the um, buckshot at the, by the way, how many boxes of buckshot were purchased at the Van Nuys gun store? One. And how many rounds, if you remember, were in that one box? Ten. After the trip to the gun store, um, did you and your brother eventually get back home? Yes. You heard your brother testify that he sort of stalled and drove around trying on purpose to be late? Um, yes. Did that happen? That happened after, yes. After what? After we went to the gun store. Right. You didn't want to be home, did you? No. Uh, you didn't want to take the boat trip? No. So stay. Were you, uh, what was your state of mind with respect to taking this boat trip? I was very afraid of going on the boat. We did not want to go on that boat trip. Let's stay with your state of mind, okay? Instead of using we, all right? You didn't want to go on the boat? No. Why didn't you want to go on the boat? Because I wasn't sure what was going to happen on the boat. It seemed real. I was real nervous about it from the conversation the night before. And, uh, and I couldn't get a handgun like Lyle tried to ask me to. And so I, I was real worried about going on that trip. Oh, uh, well, what was it that you thought might happen on it? I thought we might die. And how did you envision yourself dying on the boat trip? I didn't know what would happen. I know that the time was changed to at night, and uh, I wasn't real excited about going on a boat trip with my, my parents at that time at night. Okay. When you got back to the house, though, were your parents still there? Yes. And did you go on the boat trip? Yes. Now, you've heard Mr. Anderson, the captain, testify to what you and your brother were doing and how you looked and what happened to you on the boat trip? Yes. And you've heard your brother testify to it? Yes. And between the two of them, have they given an accurate picture of what happened on the boat trip? Basically. So let's move ahead. After the boat trip, did you uh, return with your parents to your house? Yes. 
And did you then leave the house with your brother and go somewhere? Yes. And where did the two of you go? To UCLA. And what was your state of mind at that point, given the fact that your parents didn't kill you on the boat trip? I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, it was really, it was a scary situation. I knew they were going to do something. They didn't do it on the boat trip like I thought they might have. And I just didn't know what was going to happen or when. And it was real nerve-wracking. Did you have any discussion with your brother about whether the two of you were missing something or missing something that your parents were doing or overlooking we something? We didn't, we didn't know what what they were doing, what they were up to. They weren't talking to us. And like in the car ride, it was just quiet. And it was the real- car ride, which car to ride? And, to and from the boat trip. It was silent? It was silent. And so I, I didn't know, I didn't understand what, what they were up to in their own way. I and mean, they weren't talking to us and, uh, about it. Well, they weren't you... giving us the signs that I was looking for. Okay. Well, did you think maybe you were wrong and everything was peachy and there was no problem and uh, was, life would go on as usual? No, I wasn't wrong. Well, did you think that at all? No. Why not? Because I knew what I had done and I knew that I wasn't going to get away with it. And it was just a matter of, of when. And it was real clear from the way my parents were acting that something was going on. <laughs> were they being more, were they, were they secretive around you? Ordinarily? Yes and no. Was this a family with great communication among its members? No, very little communication. Well, were they even more secretive and less communicative during these few days that we've been talking about? Sustain. Were they more communicative or less communicative during these few days that you've been testifying about? They were really quiet, uh, not saying much around us. Usually my dad was either in, a, in an up mood and laughing and, and joking and making fun of people uh, with the whole family, uh, sort of talking to my mom, but not being quiet about it. Or he was real angry and would, and would yell or act real stern. But at this time, he just wasn't saying anything. And my mom, who was also like that, was not saying a word. It was real weird. Well, had there been times you've, you've described, for example, in Kalamazoo when your father got so mad he couldn't talk, there were other times, weren't there, when your father he, wouldn't talk to you? That's only, that was, that was very unusual. Um, and it was usually because he was so angry with me that he could not talk. But it, it, was, it was never like it was in Kalamazoo. That was, that was different. But there were times when we didn't talk, but you, they would say something that was something, noticing something. It wasn't silence on purpose. This one, this time it was dead silence. From Thursday night when you had the scr struggle with your father in your bedroom until Saturday night when you're... Rephrase the question. Did you have a struggle with your father in your bedroom Thursday night? Yes. Did you throw him off of you when he was pushing you on the bed? Not quite like that, but I got from out from under him. And had he pushed you when you were reached, had he grabbed you when you had gone to He the threw bed. me on the bed. Was it a physical struggle? Yes. From that time of that physical struggle Thursday night to in the car with your parents coming back from the boat trip, had your father said one word to you? No. And was that, had that ever happened before or was that unusual? It was extremely unusual. I mean, he had done a similar uh, thing in Kalamazoo when, after I had lost, he got so angry he couldn't talk, and we didn't talk while packing the bags. But he would say a word, and he would do he would do this. He told me we weren't going to Canada, for instance. But uh, this time he didn't say a word. Well, did he seem overtly, openly angry <coughs> on Saturday? No. Now on the boat. You heard testimony from the captain. Did your father ever talk to you individually or direct anything at you personally? No. Were there some words said, like when he caught the shark? When he caught the shark, um, we went to the back. Uh, we didn't want to make it seem really suspicious. And, and he would say things to the boat captain, and wow, what a great shark it was. But to you, did he say anything to you? No.
So <coughs> at UCLA, did you and your brother discuss what you should be doing with yourselves the next day, Sunday? Yes. And what did you discuss? Uh, we discussed what we were going to do, and uh, we decided that we'd just stay away from each other, and Lyle would stay home. Was there, why, why did you decide to stay away from each other? Because we thought that if something would happen, it would happen when we were together. Why is that? It's just what we thought would happen, that if, if they were going to kill us, that they were going to do it when we were together. Um, and did you believe they were going to kill both of you, or just you? No, I thought they were going to kill both of us. Even if, though you were the person who could, was the witness to your father's molestation? That's especially why. That they would kill both of you? <coughs> or that they would kill me. No, no, I understand they'd kill you, but, but the question is why would they kill Lyle? Well, because he knew and he was the one apparently threatening Dad. And was, had there been a threat by your dad about telling? Yes. And had you told Lyle that your father had said he'd kill anybody, you told? On Friday. Had you told Lyle? Yes, I did. So when you were at UCLA, there was a decision made for you to stay apart the next day? Yes. There were different decisions made. Did you stay apart the next day? Yes. What time did you leave the house on Sunday? Around 8 o'clock. In the morning? Yeah. Before you left the house, did you let your brother know you were going? Yeah, I went over and knocked on Lyle's guest house door and uh, told him. Did you see your parents that morning? No. Now, when you knocked on Lyle's guest house door that morning, did you tell him something that had happened to you Saturday night after you got back yes. from UCLA? Let's go back to Saturday night for a minute. Did something happen to both of you together after you got back from UCLA on Saturday night? Yes. And what was it that both of you experienced Saturday night? Uh, an argument with my mother. My mother was um, yelling at us. And in the course of that argument with your mother, did your mother say something unusual? To me, yes. She said it to you, or it was unusual to you, or both? She said it to me. Um, the other thing she said, she always said, um, but what she said to me was unusual. All right. What were the other things she said that she always said? Just that she hated us and that she wished we were never born and that we ruined her life. That was this sort of a, a, a litany your mother would go in when she was really uh, just real upset and just would s start saying this then? Yes. Stay. The answer is stricken. When would your mother make that kind of statement? Whenever she, whenever she was upset, she, was, she could make it. Sometimes she wouldn't, sometimes she would. just depended how she felt, I guess. Now, she said it about how many times do you think you heard that over the course of your life? 40, 50 times. So it wasn't like she was telling you something. Did it seem like she was trying to tell you something, or did it seem like she was just in a habit of speech? No, she was. Did it seem like a speech habit of hers? When she said it, did she always say the exact same words? Yes. Now, what else did she say Saturday night that was not part of this standard upset thing that she'd say? Uh, she told me that if I would have kept my mouth shut, things might have worked out in the family. What did you think that meant? That meant that things had not worked out in the family, and I believed that she was going to kill us. Well, things had not worked out in the family, and whose fault was that? Mine, because I had told Lyle. And keeping your mouth shut, what did you think she meant? Shut about what? About the stuff between Dad and I and that I had told Lyle. And what did you think she, was try she meant by things not working out in the family? The family had had problems before, of one kind or another, like all families, hadn't it? Overall. Usually there was a lot of argument uh, in these when, when she would say, there had not been anything. Since Thursday night, there had been 
no arguments on Friday, no arguments on Saturday, and and suddenly she was coming up with this statement that the family was through, and I really thought I knew what that meant. You said the family was through. Now, she didn't say the family's through or the family's over. She said, but for what you did, things would work out. She but said that things hadn't worked out. And did you therefore interpret that to mean the family was over? Yes. And did you interpret that to mean that certain members of the family were not going to be alive? Objection being sustained. How did you interpret that? What did you interpret that with respect to the various members of the family? I thought they were going to kill Lyle and I. It seemed clear. Now, on you've told us that on Thursday night you didn't get much sleep. No. And you had that, that nightmare? Yes. Now, on Friday night, where did you sleep? In my bedroom. And did you get a lot of sleep Friday night? No. <coughs> now, on Saturday, after this argument with your mother, by the way, what was the argument actually about with your mother when you got back to the house Saturday night from uh, UCLA? The fact that the door was locked. Okay, well, why didn't you guys just unlock the door and go in? She was saying that we should have had a key, and we were saying that, well, Lyle was saying that, that she didn't give us a key, and she was saying that was no excuse for not having a key. Did you have and a car? Yes. Did you have a key ring for your car? Yes. Did it have car keys on it? Yes. Did you have a house key on the key ring? No. Why? Because she did not let me have a house key on the key ring. Did your brother have a car? Yes. Did he have a key ring for his car? I don't know. Well, did he, did your mother ever give either one of you a key that was your own? No. To any house? No. That you ever lived in? No. And did she make a statement ever about why you didn't have keys to the house? I don't remember. Do you remember how she used to refer to the houses? Were they our house, or your house, or my house? No, they were her house. Is that what she said? Yes. And did she ever make a statement about it being her house in connection with any discussion you ever had with her about keys? Yes. Okay. And what would she say in that <coughs> regard? She would say that I'm not going to give you a key to my house and uh, that, you know, there's no reason for you to have a key, that you can just knock on the door. And did that mean, Mr. Menendez, that there was no time that you could come back home from a date, from being with your friends, and get in the house if she had locked it up without her knowing it. If I hadn't left the little door open, yes. Okay, well, sometimes you left a door open, but if she had locked the whole house up, you couldn't get in without her knowing. No, except in the Calabasas house. Did you have a special way of getting into the Calabasas house? Yes. Uh, how was that? Uh, through the upstairs window. There was a, like a, like a tree, uh, I don't know how to describe it, a balcony type of thing that you would climb up the post and you could get into the window. A thing that you grow a tree up against? Yeah, a vine. A trellis? Yes. And you could crawl in a second story window? Yes. And that's how you'd get into the Calabasas house after she had locked it up? Yes. Okay, with respect to the Beverly Hills house, um, if she had locked it up and you needed to come home? No, you couldn't get in. You'd have to do what? You'd have to knock on the door or ring the doorbell. And then she'd know all that of your you movements, home. right? Yes. Did you have a sense at any time when you were living with your parents that you had any personal privacy? No. Did you have a sense that your parents were not interested in every single thing you did? No, I thought they were interested in everything I did. And did they require and request you to report to them about every single thing you did? They required it. Did you always do it? No. And why wouldn't you always do it? Because I wanted to keep certain things in my life private, and certain things I just wanted to keep to myself. Was this bad things or just ordinary things? Just ordinary things. Uh, if I was seeing a girl or this and that, I wanted to keep it to myself. So let's go back to the Saturday night. Neither one of you has a key. Now, there were keys in a place inside your brother testified. Do you remember that? Yes, in the kitchen. 
And what was supposed to, if you took one of those keys, were you supposed to put it back? Yes. Couldn't keep it? No. And did you have difficulties with that system <coughs> where to leave the house you take a key and then you got to put it back? Yes. And what would happen? If we didn't put it back, mm. she'd get very angry. Would you lose these keys? Sometimes. Because they weren't on a key ring? Yeah, we'd, we'd lose them and she'd accuse us of, of lying and actually trying to keep the key. And, uh, and so she'd get upset and eventually she'd make another key and put it in the kitchen. So did you take to leaving a door open when you were going out for the evening? Not one of the main doors, but some other doors? You yes. But would your mother, before she went to sleep, go around the house routinely and lock them all up? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes she'd overlook one? Yes. Now, after the confrontation with your mother at the door, where did you go? I, uh, I went outside. And did you have another discussion with your brother? Yes. And what was the main thing that you were discussing at that point? That something was definitely going to happen and for me to, to, uh, to, to stay away. And I was basically saying, wow, you, you better talk to him tomorrow. I want to know what's going on. Okay. What was it that made you then say, what was it that happened in that confrontation with your mother at the door that made you say, wow, Lyle, something is really happening? What she said to me about if I would have kept my mouth shut. Okay, so that statement added something to what you were already thinking? Yes. Did that make you more fearful, less fearful? It made me a lot more fearful. <laughs> and as a consequence, did you then take something with you up to your room when you re-entered the house? Yes. And when you re-entered the house, now your mother had opened the door for you, right? Yes. And then she went back to bed? She went wherever? up to her room. And did you then... When you went outside to talk to your brother again, did you close the front door? No, we left it, it open? open. You left it open? Yes. So when you went back inside now to actually go up to your room, did you take something with you? Yes. What did you take? The gun. Now, did you, did you, had you ever done anything in addition to the gun uh, after you had put the two rounds in in the car on the way back from San Diego? On Friday? On any day before this point? No. So it was in whatever condition it was in when you first brought it home on Friday? Yes. And did you now take it up to your bedroom? Yes. And where did you put it? Well, I put it on the side of my bed. And can you see? <coughs> Do you want to keep going on? All right, if this is an appropriate time, you can. You know what? Let, let me just do this one more time. All right. Forget about it. Mr. Menendez, does this photograph of your bedroom uh, show, at least sort of show, where it was you put the gun on the side of your bed that Saturday night? Yes. Uh, why don't you do an arrow from the light part down? You did two arrows? Yeah. Okay. And these arrows point to like an overhang. This is a... What kind of bed is this? There's a little... Uh, it's, a, it's a wooden bed. It's a wooden bed. Yeah, what kind of mattress? It's a, it used to be a water bed, but it had broken a long time before, and it's just a mattress inside. It's a platform type bed, isn't it? Yes. And is there an overhang? Yes, and that's why I kept the gun inside there. Okay, so it it's like sits on a platform, and then part of it overhangs, and you put the gun... Sort of like this. Sort of like this edge here. Sort of like I'm putting the pen on the edge? Yes. Like this, sort of. Okay. Sort of only one jury can see that, so I'll put the pen on the other edge. Sort of like that. Yes. It sort of didn't fall off, though, when you had the gun there. Is that correct? No. It was actually on the floor. The gun sat on the floor under the ledge. Yes. This would be a good place. All right, we'll take our recess until tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Again, don't discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Don't form any final opinions out about it. And don't permit yourselves to be exposed to anything about this case outside of the courtroom. And we'll resume tomorrow at 9 o'clock.